we're going again, right? Yeah. We're going again with Jeff Hutchison, a friend of mine from Preston. Yes, <laughs> yes. Hi, Jeff. Yeah. Welcome, man. Hey, listen, thanks for having me, guys. It's, uh, it's awesome to be here. And, and I don't want to mention the number of years yeah. that it's been since I've seen you. I don't want you to mention it okay. again. <laughs> okay. I don't think Andrew was born. Oh, you know, you know no. I think Andrew would have been born the last time I saw you, but he wasn't real big. I got you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, All right. yeah. When was the last time I did see you? Well, I'm trying to, I, you know, I've been driving over here. I was trying to figure out, and I, I just, I can't put a... I remember you doing interviews with the with the leads on the TV series Flashpoint that I did. Yes, yes. And you had all the cameras set up and all the chairs set yeah. up, and you were talking to me, and my producer came around the corner and went, what? <laughs> why, why are they talking to the story? Well, uh, producer's probably going, whoa, 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 talent only. Yeah, this the, this the, guy talks to talent only. The look on his face was incredible. Yeah, I'll never forget it. That's hilarious. Hey, I remember Flashpoint. Yeah, so, so I'm trying to think of how many years ago. So Flashpoint started when? Well, we stopped shooting it about 11 years ago. Stopped. And After the, five seasons. Five runs, yeah, so 15. Still feels longer yeah. for yeah. some reason. It's crazy. It's the reruns. It's still out there. Yeah, they are. People Everyone. love the show. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy! I'm very proud to be a, have yeah, been a part of it. Awesome Canadian. Now show. you may you may not have uh, ever met me, but I have heard your voice or heard your name a, a gazillion times, and of course heard your voice uh, a million times also. See, I'm processing not, whether or not that's good or bad, but I it's <laughs> it's, it's 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 neither <laughs> neither. <laughs> Listen, no. Ter- <laughs> I'm sure that everyone seeing this or listening to knows who you are, but when you're from Preston. And every single evening or every single morning you put on the TV and you're looking at your buddy from Preston, you brag about that. Well, and no. it, it's interesting, too, because that whole because of the CKCO now CTV Kitchener connection, because mm-hmm. uh, I worked there for 20 and then AM for 20. But so it really meant that in this region, the region of Waterloo, if you're in this area, you know, I was on TV here either at night or every morning for over 40 years. Wow. So it's interesting that it kind of works out that way. And so. the population base in southwestern Ontario is probably larger than anywhere else in Canada. Well, So and, more people are watching you at home. Well, and as you know, uh, Kitchener and this area have grown so I mean, but I mean, I live in an island now, Prince Edward Island. I'm sure we'll talk about that. But uh, the population there is 70. The population of the entire province is 70,000 less than the current population of just Kitchener. Really? Yeah. Wow. Just Kitchener. Yeah. Oh my. Kitchener, I think, was 254 when I saw maybe close to 260. We're inching up to 170. So no matter where you go, you're, you're bound to run into someone you know. Well, oh, for sure. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, if my wife was here right now, somehow you'd be connected to her if you know if you knew somebody from PEI. Right Unreal. on. Yeah, yeah. And what what's your wife's name? My wife's name is Heather. And uh, so we've been married going on. Oh, I better get this one right. No, we've been married 16. <laughs> I met her 19 years ago. We've been married for 16 years. Awesome. So yeah. Wow. And I, um, when I met her, uh, so I was still working at Canada AM at the time. So for uh, 12 years, so the first 12 years that we were kind of dating and then married, which would have been nine of those 12, I commuted weekly from Toronto to Prince Edward Island. Yeah, we know that. <laughs> yeah, I just, <laughs> I read about that. Oh, you know, I used to live in Woodstock and commute to Toronto and thought that was long. <laughs> no shit. So you, every week you flew from... Every week, every week. So I would leave, depending. When I got married, when we finally got married, I, I negotiated a couple... I, I, I worked up to the point where I could get six weeks of vacation. That's what it was. And then I negotiated a couple of weeks leave of absence every year. So I had a chunk of eight weeks off that I could use during the year. And uh, But, I mean, I probably flew in and out of Charlottetown, you know, 900 times. I mean, I'm on first wow. name base. I was on a first name. It got so good with her dropping me off, she didn't even stop the freaking car. <laughs> <laughs> we would drive by the end. I, I'd be gone in a second. But, you know, I, I mean, I... There were challenges for sure, winter and I can only imagine hardly any direct flights and everything else. But uh, and you would spend the whole week here. Uh, yeah, so I get back here at uh, usually eight thirty Sunday night, and I would try and get out of here on a on a kind of normal regime where it wasn't taking more time or spending vacation, uh, depending on flights, eleven or twelve. So and were would... all these flights sort of booked up prior? Well, you know, you know what I would I would book. You know, if I saw a sale, and, and as you know, I mean, over that period of time, uh, flying was actually much more. Uh, cheaper than it is now because now it's stupid uh, yeah, but yeah, uh, sure. prices now are absolutely crazy but if i saw a sale i would book four or five months in advance but 
Wow. I have I this. Bet. I have this little. I have this little. Uh, every now and then, I'll talk to groups, but I don't do it very much anymore. And uh, present company accepted. But <laughs> I have this little numbers thing that I go by, and I don't ever disclose how much I spent flying uh, to fly. But I did spend thirty five thousand dollars parking. No kidding. Just parking. Yeah. <laughs> Over 12 years. It's quite a bill. Just, just parking. That's a few days in Toronto. Yeah, for just sure. parking, for sure. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So. And you and you brought Heather on this trip with you. T- right. And so. she's going to see. Pink. Tonight. Yeah. Yo, yes. that's a. Man, that's awesome. I wanted to take my lady to go see yeah. Pink. We, we saw her before. Pink, but yeah. Now my, yeah, my, my, I, I got two step, uh, step kids and they yeah. want to see pink, you know. Well, she's, uh, so she came and we've stayed at a place in, in Kitchener and, uh, she, uh, drove her down to Toronto yesterday and she met some PEI friends. So there's a group for them, they're Airbnb in it down there, going to see pink. Cool. And then, yeah, so. Well, but, I have to say thanks, Jeff, because you said, uh, a while ago that when next time you're in town, you'd come by and, have this uh, chat with Andrew and I. And you're a man of your word, so thank you. Well, my... And it's only because his wife's going to see Pink and he doesn't, doesn't want to hang out <laughs> no, with her. No, wow. no, no, no. It's okay. It's no nope. excuse. It's, it's, good it's because I've already had my three <clears throat> initial three days with the grandkids, right? Nice. Okay. So then, then Heather's leaving. That gives me a little break, and then we start again. So, yeah. Oh, Plus, Preston. Come on. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. People out there just Welcome. don't understand. <laughs> no, they don't know the bond. <laughs> He said, as he sits in, in Galt, of all places. Yeah, people would never, never imagine, but you and I were Cub Scouts together. Yeah, that's, that's right. Third was Preston. That third Preston. Third yeah. Preston. <laughs> I was so excited we oh, had that little oh, golden eagle. Oh, my God. Patch. Now it's now it's a deep dive interview. That is so true. <laughs> Getting crazy. Third Preston at St. John's Anglican Church. 100%. Yeah, which I think is still there. So. It is. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Crazy, huh? Now, I mean, now C- C- T- C- CTV is, is Kitchener-based. Uh, no, right. CTV, the local station here. So, C- so CTV is a network, obviously, and it's based in Toronto. So, uh, and one oh, of the okay. local stations. Okay. So, for example, Kitchener. Now, well, back then Kitchener was, but it, it, you know, uh, they have a network across the country. You know, oh, yeah. Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Halifax. Yeah, yeah. You know, London now, Windsor, Kitchener. So, but when I worked at London, so I worked there from. Uh, well, I started part time in '76 and left in '98, and then did Canada and part time five years from '93 to '98, and then was at Canada Am for 18 years after that. So, but they were all that was all based in Toronto. So that's uh, a lot of news and weather, man. It's a lot of weather, uh, <laughs> but you know, I mean, here's the thing. So the whole decision for me to go to Canada, so in 1988, if I can go back there. Um, I was, they were kind of doing a changing of the guard of CTV's Olympic personnel. So I, I, I you might remember the name Bill Incall. Of he course. Was, yeah, Bill Absolutely. was the sports director uh, at uh, CKCO and he hired me. And so Bill had done, I think, five Olympics. But in 88, um, Bill came into me and said, yeah, they're going to ask you to go. They're going to change things up. And, you know, I thought it was very gracious that, you know, because they weren't going to ask him and all the kind of sports director guys, the legacy guys, if you want, weren't going to be go. They were going to be replaced with uh, people in their 30s at that time. So I went and did uh, the Calgary Olympics. I was the Bob and Luge commentator. The claim to fame there is that I was calling the Jamaican bobsled team crash live in Canada when it happened. Really? So, yeah. So, awesome. Which, which, wow. which the movie Cool <clears throat> Running is uh, not yeah. out of my call, but certainly came. So in 1992... <laughs> So that I did that, and in 1992, uh, my daughter Sarah was born, uh, basically three days before I left for Calgary. So oh, wow. yeah, so in 1992, it sort of came down <gasps> to uh, I had been asked to fill in on Canada Am by Dan Matheson, or Barcelona was hanging out there. And best decision I ever made was two decisions. One was okay, I, I'll go down and talk to the Canada Am people, but two. And certainly you guys are in a business that you know this, that you don't say. So a lot of people have a negative connotation of people who did the weather back then. And I thought, you know what? I, I don't care. Uh, it's like a little sports and weather thing. But, you know, you get the you get the weather bunny thing. You get the, you know, weather kind of thing. But I, huh. I yeah, and I decided, you know what? I, I'm, I don't care what it is. Uh, in the long run, that's going to be better for me than doing, just doing the Olympics. And... When I ended up getting down there in full time in '98, 
CTV at that time still owned Sportsnet. So if you, if you, like CTV for a very short period of time owned Sportsnet and TSN. Wild. For a very short period of time. And none of the anchors, and they told me, you know, when you go away, contact the guys over at Sportsnet to come in and fill in. Well, none of them would do it because there was three little sportscasts every morning, but they didn't want to do the weather. Mm. They didn't want to be seen as oh, I sports see. guys doing the weather. Oh, sure. So that's what I'm talking about. There was a, a connotation that you didn't want to okay. get pegged as a weather guy. But <laughs> when I went in there, I mean, I turned that into, I mean, I probably did 350 remotes from different towns and villages in Canada. I probably did 50 from different countries around the world. It was the best thing I ever did. But it was because I thought, okay, I don't, I don't, it doesn't bother me. Like I was the kind of the sports guy, I was a sports director here. And it didn't bother me at all uh, to make that leap, but it would some people, as I as I kind of found out. But I it that never tells was me an a issue. lot about that person. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, there's a confidence issue there. Well, yeah, I, I know. I mean, it was very strange when they first started saying no. I, I I didn't understand why, and until one of them just directly told me why. So, and some of those guys actually, you know, they're still kind of around in sports now. But hey, they've had great careers. I don't blame them at all, but I think. I think you you might be taking yourself a little too seriously if you think you f- fill in and give a 60, two-minute weather forecast that people are going to go, oh, that guy knows nothing about the Toronto Maple Leafs. <laughs> you know, like, and that, at the end of the okay. day, yeah, at the end of the day, what are they, what are you worried about? I remember once Jeff was huh. on the air and he asked the audience, the, the viewing audience, to send in um, their ideas as to what they, they should do with the Toronto Maple Leafs that year because they weren't doing so well. I don't know if you remember this. So I wrote in and I said, you should m- mount them all on a piece of Bristol board and cover them with saran wrap and send it to school as a leaf collection. Because <laughs> we used to have to do that when we were kids. Yeah. Remember doing that? Totally. And, and not he, only that. He read it on the air. That, yeah, that very question still awesome. applies to this day. <laughs> Yeah, but, but I said, you better not, because... I would have suggested they put the, to get a passing mark. I would have suggested they put the ice in the... In the drink, in, in, in the whiskey. Oh, you know, it's always it's it's always it's always a tough balance being you know like TSN k- keeps getting accused of being the Toronto Sports Network, and you know oh. you always oh. had to be careful. <laughs> you always had to be careful uh, not to be too, and I wasn't because I was never a Leaf fan at all. But not to even where you're broadcasting from to be too Toronto centric. Now, for years, Canada AM stayed in Agent Court because it was a uh, just a. a a background that was, you know, a pick, something that didn't identify you being in Toronto. The Today Show, for example, you know, they they heighten the fact that they're in Rockefeller Plaza in New York City, and right. they go out in the plaza. But we have a little different sensibilities here. At least we did. So we were always very careful to make sure that, you know, we we weren't shoving the fact that we're broadcast from Toronto down their throats because we would get, we would get people. And to your point, and this happened all the time, that people thought. Uh, I remember when I worked at Kitchener, people thought Lloyd Robertson did the national news in our studios because Kitchener is the television mm. station they're watching. It's right. CTV, and Lloyd was doing the CTV national news. And I think people thought that at very, you know, just who weren't really, nor should they have been, but, you know, thought about it or connected to what we were doing. Right. They, people would call up all the time in Kitchener and ask for Lloyd. You know, hi, can I speak to Lloyd? <laughs> <laughs> well, not right now. Right. I, I never, guess uh, I yeah. never thought of that. Yeah, but that is crazy. where people's heads go. I'm, yeah. Totally, you know, they watch yeah. the TV. There's no information yeah. otherwise. They don't understand. Yeah. It. Well, and people would say to me, you know, when I was living in PEI, they would say, "Oh, do you do that show at Halifax?" So it's just because you know people don't, you know, people don't get into a movie set, and people don't get into TV stations, and people so they don't they they just they all the time people are seeing our finished product, yeah. and our finished yeah. product is presented to them on a screen. And that's what they see, and they very rarely think of where it came from or or whatever. So it was always interesting to me. Like I, I, you know, I never, I never uh, thought that. Wow, this person is nuts. I thought, holy cow, I can see where that's coming from. Well, now having said that, I've worked in, in film for uh, well, my whole my whole life, pretty much. I don't know if I've ever seen a news station set. No, is that right? I don't. Is that right? I, I don't think so. Like I'll, I'm thinking we'll back. I'm like, just yeah, see one. And you Where? better go in a hurry. Oh, it's is it there? I think they're leaving in September. To oh. um, I'm not sure where, but that boy, that really legendary building for this area at uh-huh. 864 King. I believe they're out of it in a month. 
Yeah. Oh, are, really? Are they just moving? Or well, it... you know what? I think it's a that building. Like, oh, that building is pretty empty right now. Do you know, uh, do you know where it is? It's right across from across the hospital. From the Kitchener Hospital. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I do. So, so that I building know. is pretty empty right now because uh, they've downsized so much. So I... Now, is this due to streaming services and all these other things? Well, it's certainly due to... Uh, and po- podcasts, even? Yeah. And, and well, you know, it's it's due to, at the end of the day, uh, people have different viewing habits. And at the end of the day, um, people who don't watch television the same way they did when we were growing up. Right. It, no, so I have three stepkids and three kids. So their ages right now range from 20 to 46. Not one of them watches morning TV. Not one of them... I don't uh, either. No, yeah. no. And and not one of them watches news at 11. And so, I mean, because it's all right here, right? Yeah, I get mean, it on their phone. It's all right yeah. here right now. And I think the problems you're hearing with, you're seeing with Bell Media, um, oh, this is great. We're going to go everywhere. I love it. The problem yeah, is, let's do it. Let's do <laughs> but it. The, but the problem you're seeing right now with Bell Media is twofold. Uh, one is, uh, for example, in our show, when they uh, canceled our show and started your morning, they were pretty convinced that a younger crowd would come because at that point there was uh, your morning, Maryland, the social and e-talk all being run by the same person. And that never materialized for them. But had they done a little bit of homework, they would have known uh, that young, the crowd they were looking for do not get up and watch television anymore, you know? And uh, Hmm. then, then secondly, they, they have kind of run into the problem with actual news has never been a profit center. The people who ran CTV prior to Bell buying it in 2011 were so passionate. Well, I don't know, Yvonne Fitzson, I'm sure he probably greenlit. You, uh, do you know Yvonne? I mean, he greenlit uh, Flashpoint. He's, he was the former president. I know, I know his name. Yes. So Yvonne Fitzson, mm-hmm. former president. And the difference right now between what CTV is now, and I can't speak to words CBC or anything, but CTV, which is one of the, lar- the largest network in the country, is that it was being run by people with passion and people who had a vision of where they wanted it to go. In 2010, he paid, I think it was $165 million for the rights for the Olympics in Vancouver and London. Wow. He, he could give a shit about London. He didn't care. He wanted the Vancouver Olympics to be in Canada on CTV. And you know what he did with a lot of the free time? I mean, it, he was promoting CTV shows and CTV during that time period because of the millions and millions. of it was a, It's like, like a once in a lifetime opportunity to have brilliant. that. So that's brilliant. <clears throat> and that's the vision he had. And, that's, and his uh, right-hand man was Suzanne Boyce. And you could go through our building and there were people who, you know, thought, oh my God, these guys are... You know, they didn't like them, but they, it, it's like having, it's like having Clyde Lemieux in your hockey team. You hate him unless he's on your team. You know, it's <laughs> like having Brad Marchand, I'll update it for you. It's like having Brad <laughs> Marchand, it's like having Brad Marchand on your team in Boston. You hate him, but if he was on your team, you'd love him. You'd so, to have yeah, him, yeah. So these guys were, and then Bell came in and they had no vision. Uh, they, uh, you know, streaming came in like, almost. It had started then, but you know, streaming became more what it was uh, on demand in terms of news, information, music, podcasts. Everything started to come in, and now they find themselves losing millions and millions of dollars every year with news, which you would know from the get-go. News isn't a profit center, um, and uh, you know, just last within the last month you've heard them say they're applying to the CRTC to reduce their news obligations. Mm-hmm. So all these layoffs you've seen and you know like Lisa Laflam, like Rod Black, like Michael Landsberg, like uh, Dan O'Toole, uh, like Ben Mulrooney, those are all money dumps for sure, you know, because those were some of the highest paid CTV ah. people. Now some of them uh, you know, mm-hmm. I think the Lisa thing there was uh, that's 80 to 85% of money dump for sure. Uh, some of this ancillary thing uh, about the hair and the age and everything else, there's probably a little bit of that in there too um, for her. But, you know, she's... Uh, she's, she, she's landed on her feet. Yeah, she is. And to this day, you know, she if you ask her, I, I'm 100% confident in saying this, if you ask her, you know, what happened, they told her it was a business decision and no one has said anything else to her about it except that. And why would they? Because they, they don't, they said right. it's a business decision. See you later. End of discussion. So what they, they didn't expect was a blowback. So they left her hanging to some degree. Well, or she must get an idea. 
No, she had no idea. Oh, oh no, all these are all the, the so when oh no, no, no the, she they she had no idea. None of them had any idea when it happened. Oh um, my god. I know. And then Really? I, that just came blindsided? Oh totally. <clears throat> blindsided is the exact word. Oh no, she had no idea. Rod, uh, who I've spoken to since then, and Rod got let go. Rod actually was let go a year ago, August, and asked if he could stay another five weeks because there was some football games he wanted to do, and they said yes, he could. But with Rod, with uh, uh, Ben Mulrooney specifically, those two for sure, they, they were able to carve their own uh, reason for leaving and publicize it. For right. you know, uh, you know, Rod said he's moving on to different things. Blah 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 blah. Uh, same mm-hmm. with uh, Ben Mulroney, he's getting on to producing or whatever. I, I haven't seen anything, but they were able to formulate their own response in public, where Lisa wouldn't wouldn't uh, acquiesce to saying what they wanted her to say. Thus, the famous YouTube video that she did. Yeah. So wow. that, yeah, that that's sort of what happened with those. And there was others. I mean, they've been knocking anchors off across the country the last couple of years. Just cash. And I mean, they're not the only station i guess you know, no not the only network doing that no we're, and that's seeing it everywhere. that's 100 percent true like you know now you look you know you next thing you go yeah well tsn are knocking people oh yeah no tsn that's bell but cbc is doing it to a lesser extent um you know bell just wiped out their foreign bureaus and half their ottawa bureau so you know where's news going that's the situation and they wow yeah they'd like it to be mm. as as uh economic as they can make it which is almost impossible local news has been going by the wayside for a long time well you know that's so true unfortunately and, and well we don't even have a newspaper really that no well, f- we do you you have 20 of them they're all piled up at the end of the driveway <laughs> that, I took, there's just one there and i took it in okay <laughs> <laughs> okay, so flyers aren't newspapers. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. I'm sorry. I I don't know. He's young. I, yeah. <laughs> it's true though. I I fear for and you know you started seeing it. Uh, was it 2017? Maybe it was 2016. When all of a sudden CTV dumped all the local sports departments across the country. So now you're sitting there wondering. And I know Randy Steinman up here, another Preston boy, yeah. did a great job of covering local sports locally here. Absolutely. And it was different in different markets, but you know, because different markets, some had pro teams, we didn't. But so that was the first sign that okay, mm. you know, then when Toronto, their so-called flagship station, started using TSN if there was any sports stories, well, you know where that was going. And um, but to your point, I really fear for local news because if if the today's well not today's i mean if, if, if people today be the teenagers or in their 20s 30s are getting their information here then you know as he holds up his phone for the is this yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah but here so where will they get it and how how um accurate will it be i think that's what we're going to miss about the well what's interesting is you said that the young people aren't watching the news in the morning right or in the evening right so do they want it do they want local news? Do well, they- well. Now, having said that, like, I mean, the the world seems to. It's like uh, the local thing, at least in my my world, because I'm I totally identify with this. 15, 20 years ago, I would put I would wake up in the morning, put the weather station on, and watch that for twelve hours. I don't know why. You I really just put dug it the on. weather. Yeah, and then I would, okay. I would be on Facebook Glad or play here. music and other things. <laughs> well, I don't. Yeah, I really don't know why, <laughs> but um. It was always good seeing a sunny day all day, even if you exactly. weren't outside. Um, but yeah, I, I, it is kind of weird. I, you know, now, now that we have uh, the world seems to be communicating on less of a local basis and on more of a wider basis, and um, people are getting what they assume is information from things like this, from podcasts, it's or true. from, you know, people are making up their own 100% thing. True. You know. Um, Obviously, Tucker Carlson now has his thing on Twitter, and he does his own thing with his own. And people are watching that. They're not going to Fox News. Did you see Elon Musk change Twitter now to an X? Yeah. It's not a bird yeah. anymore? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, did that, I, I, I saw it was coming. And what's amazing <laughs> is the whole world knows that in like a day. Yeah. Well, because, you and, know? I mean, that's true. You know, it's the thing, too. Like, you've seen what ha- has happened to Twitter because Musk is obviously a little more right wing than Jack was, who owned Twitter before, et cetera, et cetera. And that's just become a cesspool of vile hate and trolling. But um, <laughs> yeah. it is. That's what it is. 
But to your question about do they even want news, I, I, no matter what age you are, like I find when, when kind of being in the news business was your life for years, it was very difficult for me to wean myself off. Now I could, now I, I have. But I think people, all, no matter how old they are, if I think people want to know if something happens that's going to affect them. Yeah, So true. Right. So if you, you know, so you might not be bothered, care. And when I say you, I mean generally, uh, you know, people may not be bothered, care right now about the situation in the U.S., the war in Ukraine, blah, blah, blah. Maybe they should be, but it's totally. But if something's happening in your your hometown or your neighborhood or your province, your health care, your, your money, people are worried about their health care and their bank account. That's what people are worried about. And so when things affect them, I think if something were, were to happen that would affect you, you'd, you'd try and search out hopefully the best source to get the information from. But the dilemma is, mm. is that what is that source? Now, news organizations are still you know, uh, they still have their own, uh, you know, apps and, and online news. Um, but if something happened here at the corner of Bruce and Ainsley that was massive, would it make it? And then, you know, the old Galt reporter would have had it like that. Absolutely. The Preston Times, well, they would have had it the next day. CKCO well, would we, send a totally. camera. Totally. That's what I'm saying. <clears throat> and and so now, <clears throat> so that's what I think the answer there is. It's it's people, you know, just are, if, they're, if it affects them or there's an interest with them or it affects someone they know, um, these big picture issues... Um, I, th- you know, we had a hurricane in, uh, uh, PEI last September, Fiona, worst storm ever to hit Canada. Uh, I had a ton of damage at our, I mean, I'm still repairing and it was oh tens God. of thousands of dollars. I was insured and everything. And I, I mean, I always felt good because I knew people had it worse. <laughs> I mean, I always didn't get too depressed because it's been overwhelming to try and repair it. But my point of this is, so, uh, the rest of the country hears about Fiona and uh, we just had a little Canada AM reunion at our place a couple of weeks ago. We had 20 people, of, you know, Seamus Serene came down and right. Deb Thompson was there. And, the, and we had 20 former people. You down. had the bus. Yeah, the you, boss. You got you got a you got a big van. 12, 12 Oh, I did. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I, I read about. It. I borrowed a. I absolutely borrowed a twelve passenger van. Oh boy! Uh, and the source of that van is Air Ontario. So they okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah, cool. Yeah, exactly. cool. I'm trying to keep it local. So, but the That's thing funny. was, they all came, uh, and um, you know, uh, we they were just going like this at the damage. Now, and like now, the like foliage has grown up, but I mean, there are we lost 40% of our trees, so you know, that's several hundred wow, thousand really? trees. And they that's lost a hundred thousand apple trees. I didn't even know we had apple trees, we lost a hundred thousand of them, so we lost ma- probably over a million trees, maybe more. Like, just and um, and they came down, and they're going, Oh my god, what what caused so the point there is that when a big event happens. And whether it's Fiona, which is affecting the daily lives of people in PEI till now and is reported on in PEI. Um, but outside of PEI, it's kind of, it happens, uh, you know, if you, you, it's kind of like walking down the side of a mountain. When you first hear about it, you go, oh, wow. And then you get a little bit further down the mountain and you're a little bit further away from it. You go, oh, yeah. And by the time you're at the bottom of the mountain, you forgot you're at the top. So, but it's not, I don't blame anyone. It's just out of sight, out of mind. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens. And that's what happens. It's like the war in Ukraine. <laughs> It starts, we're all over that, and then now it's still going on. And if, you know, we're the gatekeepers who cover news and get over there, they're diminishing in size. So it's harder to, it's harder to cover all these events and, and more so explain them to a generation that doesn't even understand them. Do you think that's, that's interesting? Do you think that journalism and, and, um, news uh, has lost a bit of integrity, kind of like maybe a lot of other industries? I, You know what? I hope not. Um, mm-hmm. I think that, you know, uh, if you've seen the movie Bombshell about... Um, oh, who was... Well, it was about Fox News. It was about uh, Gretchen I, Carlson. and uh, I haven't seen uh, Yeah. Oh. So, but Fox News got, for sure, got uh, Donald Trump elected. There's no doubt about it. That's 100% for sure. Uh, because... Donald Trump. So Fox News is catering to the base of Donald Trump, which, uh, you know, the so-called uh, magma uh, crowd, which have a few different beliefs than I do and a few different beliefs than the majority of people, but millions and millions of them. So w- Fox News and Trump saying the words fake news, I think, changed everything because I worked in an organization for years. Hmm. Let me give an example. I remember when uh, Osama bin Laden's uh they caught him in um, uh, Islamabad or Abbottabad. And 
I remember CTV, this was the early days of social media and somebody had posted on social media, oh, something going on at this house in Abbottabad, believe they caught uh, Bin Laden and someone else. So there, it wasn't inundated. Like, but CTV at that point still refused to run it till they could verify it and then get a second verification. That's how deep they would go. All news organizations for years and years and years. Now that everybody in the world has one of these, totally holding up the phone again. Yeah. Um, now that everybody has <laughs> one of those, girl. we're all we're all reporters. We're all cameramen. We're all yeah. We're all are we all you know our own self made style journalists? Yes, we are. Like a lot of people have done that. So that's another issue. Um, I think what we're losing out here is is getting both sides to every story. And I also think that, you know, in some instances, yeah, maybe there is a little um, bias there, uh, probably not on purpose, but a little bias there, uh, you know, from CBC, from CTV. Yeah. But I don't think it's anything. I don't think it's anything like you've got the leader of the conservatives running around you know, out taking pages out of the Donald Trump playbook. I mean, that's just not true. And Canada has never operated that way. And I hope we don't. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <clears throat> but I, to, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the credibility of these huge news organizations has been damaged and they've, all they've ever done is kept doing the job the way they did it. And now they've sort of been forced to change as well. So yeah, I will tell you this. I am glad I got out when I did. So yeah, I was sort of well. I was sort of thinking that your time frame is like perfect. It was. You know, I remember saying when I so I was sixty two when I got out, and and I remember so I've been in TV forty one years at that point, and I remember thinking, um, and I'd been, I gave them a year's notice uh, before I was leaving, and that was the eleventh year I'd gone back and forth between uh, Toronto and Charlottetown every week. And uh, the reason I gave him the notice when I did was, one, my boss at the time, who wasn't the boss, my boss at the time, of course, she was so great to me. If, you know, if I got stuck in PEI, we had a bureau there, I could do my portion of the show. So she'd done me a lot of favors, and I promised to give her a lot of time. But I knew the second I wouldn't miss it anymore that I could walk into her office and say, okay, I'm good to go. And I, I hit that point, and I have never missed it for a second. And I think the problem, and you would see this too, the problem is you run into too many people who don't know where that timeline is in their career. It's always better to go a year too soon than a year too late. So I think that, you know, I wasn't ever hoping for anything else. I, and I've never missed it, but I worked with people who are still trying to hang on and, and, and probably shouldn't be, hmm. you know. Interesting. Yeah, just get out and enjoy it, so. And, and you don't see yourself doing anything in the future, like a talk show? Or... No, gosh, I, no, um, <clears throat> no. You know, I think we all have an expiry date. So when, uh, when I left Canada AM, uh, uh, <laughs> something else just popped into my head. So I'm going to tell you about that <laughs> when Canada AM changed uh, management. But when I left Canada AM, uh, Scenic, I had done some, Scenic had, uh, Scenic River Cruises had uh, done two shows or done two buys with Canada AM uh, to go over. And I went to France twice, once on the Rhone River, once on the Seine. And we did a show every day for five days up from this cruise. And so uh, their, that worked for them and their exposure in Canada went through the roof. And so they asked me if I would do a, a cruise uh, and they would. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, you're so will you do a cruise. And I thought, oh, my God. First, I don't care who you are. <laughs> Someone asks you to do a cruise. If you say yes, the first thought you have is, oh my gosh, what if nobody comes? Like, what, <laughs> what, what if there's no cruise? So anyway, I did. I did, And that first cruise sold out in three weeks. And it was all Canada and people. It was 100, I remember. 165. So then they called me and said, you know, that sold out. Will you do another? And you can choose between... Uh, the Rhine or the Mekong, and I said, "Well, sure, I'm taking the Mekong because I'll never, I'm never getting myself to Southeast Asia." And they said, "Well, we wanted to take, a, we wanted you to say the Rhine, so can you do that too?" So the, the point there is sort of, I was, I still had a bit of a brand, I think is the word I'll use, and so those cruises all sold out. And then uh, when I got to, then that was a lot of fun. Uh, to do those and when I got to PEI I hooked up with a just on a weird LinkedIn thing uh, he, I was contacted and he asked me to do a, a cruise and I thought this is great so on March 19th 2019 
we had the first information night for this cruise on the Danube. 44 months later, that cruise actually went. So, Whoa. well, because of COVID, right? It kept getting oh, canceled, sure. canceled, canceled. Wow. Three of them were canceled. Ah. So, I mean, that's, and now, and I'm, I'm, I, I think my expiry date in terms of recognition or brand or whatever, and my interest in it have both gone on that famous kind of other side of the mountain downhill. And I'm totally good with it. I mean, I MC a few little things here and there if I'm asked or, uh, or, or if I want to do them. And I'm, oh my gosh, I was at the Cavendish Beach Music Festival seeing Kane Brown a couple of weeks ago with the people with the 12 Passions, your van, just as an aside. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I drove out in the van. They didn't know, but it was really for me a test run in my mind. But um, I was in a box up there, and some guy comes up to me who was in the box and friends of friends of friends, and said, "Geez, I remember watching you on Bowling for Dollars at my grandma's house." So I hadn't done Bowling for Dollars. <laughs> Whoa! Yeah, yeah, I hadn't done Bowling for Dollars since 1992. I don't know what Bowling for Dollars is. No. Well, <laughs> Well, we'll, we'll you know, find something. it on YouTube. Yeah, so, so Bowling for Dollars was a show that CKCO did. I did it for seven years. Bill Lincoln, I think, did it for seven before me, and, and it went on. And, okay. and we'd go to the Waterloo Lanes, five-pin bowling, seven people a show, bowl three strikes, win the jackpot, when, which went up when I started the show. Uh, an astonishing fifteen dollars per miss. <laughs> so wow. we were in danger there, giving away ninety bucks a show. <laughs> Canadian <laughs> game Canadian shows. Yeah. So and that's what it was. It, and and these people were from all walks of life. Um, and it was one of the most popular. Uh, remember back then, in eighty five, eighty six. Well, eighty five, eighty six. So the local news then used to get one hundred and thirty thousand viewers, which was spectacular for the size of the area and the competition. When bowling would come on, Saturdays at 630, 180,000 viewers. Go up really? 50,000. Yeah. Yeah. And people watched it for two reasons. They watched it for two reasons. 1% of the viewing population was interested in the bowling. 99% of the viewing audience was interested in the people actually bowling. I mean, I had a guy on once, and, yeah, and, and yeah. you'd get all kinds of there. And I, I remember saying to him, so what do you do for a living? He says, I work for the Toronto Star. I thought, oh, my God. <coughs> this is fantastic. I said, so... So what do you do? He says, two paper routes. So, <laughs> so that's awesome. yeah, yeah. So, but that, but again, it, but just goes to show you that, that, I mean, even, you know, today, you know, you, you, if you're in a job where you were kind of exposed to people for 40, I mean, I'm not, people don't know me because I did a movie or sang a song or did, I just happened to be doing a job that I like doing and especially in the Canada AM scenario, we became friends with literally millions of Canadians. We became like part of the family. And that's the whole goal of what we were trying to do there. Absolutely. We totally became part of their family. If, if I had one, I had a thousand people come up to me in an airport and go, oh my God, I feel like I know you. And I'd automatically say that we've done our job. And wow. that's, yeah, that's what, because they, they just became part of the family. Do you think that people liked you less on a rainy day? Oh, they hated me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I tell people that, and I was never a meteor, meteorologist. I mean, I was always a presenter. Yeah. Uh, I did weather a little bit in Kitchener, um, and Dave McDonald tutored me and, and kind of, you know, the, the venerable weather guy from CKCO. And so, and then I did go to, to some hurricane conferences and different kind of things. But my entire job was this. It was making you believe I knew what I was talking about. He's doing the same thing today. Right now. It sounds like a TV personality. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was my entire job, was making you believe I knew what I was talking about. I mean, and I, I mean that in the most linear, straightforward kind of way, because it's just, the, the mail is unbelievable, you know. I, I, well, I believe you. I can only imagine. Yes, exactly. I believe you. Yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> That's hilarious. I love it. So when I paused there, I want to, you know, when we were talking about Canada AM, so, and when we were talking about the fact that they didn't get the viewership when your morning came in. Mm -hmm. So this is the way your more like Canada M they just abruptly decided brand over 43 years. See you later. Like one day it's here. Next day it's not. So the pre that happened in June of 2016, the previous October, uh, at that point it was, uh, Marcy Bev and I were the hosts of the show. And we got a call saying, call into the, president of CTV News, do this conference call. She wants to talk to everybody. So we called in and she said, 
Uh, just want to let you know, as of tomorrow, you are now all members of the uh, entertainment division. Uh, and that wasn't the name CTV gave it, but it was the same people who commissioned flight. So you're part of that division. Uh, any questions? And like, we're, I mean, we're just sitting there. I'm in my condo in Toronto. I'm going, what? I said, I said, uh, we were just gobsmacked. So that's the day Canada ended being news. And when you were news, you weren't a promotion arm of anybody. You know, you would you would do some deals with me because I wasn't the one sort of uh, delivering the news. But you were always worried about conflict of interest. You know, it, it, anchors like Peter Mansbridge got in trouble because he went in, out and talked to a group and took money. And I can't remember, but let's mm -hmm. say hypothetically, anchor, national anchor goes out and talks to Chrysler. And then Chrysler has a strike. And you say something on the news that one person perceives to be biased in favor of Chrysler. That's conflict of interest, even if you didn't do it. So we were always very aware of that, of conflicts. Mm. And, and I had a little more leeway. I mean, I probably hosted that show 300 times, like sat in the chair, but I had a little more leeway with me in terms of these scenic things that we could do these uh, uh, kind of interstitial things on, on the show. But um, the minute you're in entertainment, that's all gone. So that opens you up to do anything. Mm. So I remember getting a call from a lady named Nancy McLean, who was now going to be our new boss, who I think in the interim seven years now... Left, was let go from CTV in one of their big cuts. And I think she's now working for Scott McGilvery Productions, the, the home rental guy. But I, I meet her downtown, and uh, she uh, were sitting there, and she was meeting all of us individually. And she said to me, um, so, how are you doing? I said, good. She goes, the first thing I want to tell you is I've never seen your show. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. So I'm sitting there going, oh, this is not going to be good. So that was in October. Huh. And the day I knew Canada AM was going to change forever was this day, is that I believe it was October 25th, just about two weeks after that phone call. And uh, our uh, morning producer comes in our ear and tells us, she says, so uh, actually it was the morning meeting. She said, so at 7.40, now 7.40 in the TV world in the morning, if you're into those things, is where you put a major newsmaker. You know, if you got Hillary Clinton, you put her there. If you got the prime minister, you put her there. If you got the minister of finance, you put him there. Like, because that was a high viewership. And our interviews would traditionally, no matter who you were, be maybe five, anywhere from three and a half to five, just the way morning TV rolls. You got to get a couple of segments in. If you're an outstanding person, we might go eight and you might get a two-part. So we're told that morning that we are going to run Adele's, the debut of Adele's Hello Video. Uh, which was uh, Denny Ooh. Villeneuve was the director of that. And then we were going to chat about it for two minutes after. So the video was 6.50. And uh, we, <laughs> yeah, so it, and we chatted for two. Like Hillary Clinton wouldn't get eight minutes and 50 seconds. So we chatted. And that day right there, I knew that everything was changing. Uh, there was no reason for no. Canada AM <clears throat> as it stood to run a six minute. You know, we'd certainly run little snippets of videos before, but just to let the whole thing go and then talk about it after. Uh, that was the day to me everything changed. And then by the next June, we were done. So and that was like the credibility moment. I think that that was the moment I knew that we had walked into the ugly slash exciting. <laughs> yeah, the, the entertainment section. Yeah, yeah, yeah true. Exactly. True. No, exactly. Because, you know, I'm sure that uh, eTalk played a portion of that video, not the whole thing, but they looked on it as a vehicle that where ETOC couldn't play the whole thing, and since they assumed that it, it's going to be probably the same people, we'll play it all here. And then, you know, the social would probably talk about it because it was a Canadian directing. And, you know, what would I... And, and I never did follow along but uh, as to what happened, but that's the day I knew we went over to the <clears throat> excitingly dark entertainment side. So that's right wow. there. We knew it was over. Okay, so speaking of entertainment... <clears throat> I would like to uh, go back to Lisa Laflamme. Okay. And the power of shoe. Oh, yeah. okay. okay. I want to hear about this band. So there, there was a band that, that it, it, Danny it, Bailey, who sat in this very chair, exactly. rested his yeah, balls yeah. against this very table, <laughs> and according to what's written yeah. here. And yeah, I think you just gosh, now I've touched that now, across, haven't I? Yeah, I've yeah. Got yeah, you're going to want to wash yeah, your hands. <laughs> so... This is the this is the band that was born out of uh, the need of hockey socks for the CKCO Men's Wednesday Night Hockey League. Okay. So, um, there were, so the power of shoe. <laughs> yeah, so no, it's a different motivation. It's well, exactly. <laughs> Work with me on this. So, the, so um, the power of shoe. 
consisted of, uh, at the time, uh, Dan Bailey, myself, uh, a cameraman, uh, a, a director, um, and uh, another guy, a friend of the thing, there was initially five of us, uh, who all worked at CKCO except one. And we thought we'd get together and kind of just jam and see what would happen. And then it turned out that the CKCO Men's Wednesday Night Hockey League wanted to get new socks for their guys. Sorry, Jeff, what's your instrument? I was a drummer. Beautiful. Yeah, I was, cool. And I'm classic garage band drummer to this day. Sweet, yeah, sweet. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I'm more of a Please. Ringo drummer. You know, less, okay. less fills the better. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> cool, cool. No, that's cool. I don't understand any of that, but he's just, Continue. just a few drums you, and just... <laughs> in things yeah. we said today, Ringo never put a fill in. If you ever listen to that Beatles song? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> never put a fill. It's just me. Huh, anyway, that's my drumming idol right there. So um, we just, so then we thought, well, why don't we get the band together and do like a, a dance and raise money to buy these socks? So uh, we were practicing, and Lisa had kind of just started at the station at that time, and uh, I became very good friends with her, and, and I found that she was a singer. And she played guitar. So next thing you know, Lisa's in the band, and we're strumming our hearts up, playing our hearts away. And sure enough, at the uh, is it the what's the community center, uh, the Pioneer Park Community Center? Uh, yeah. I think one day in late or early 1990, in mid 1990, uh, we went out there, raised enough for the hockey socks, and then we stayed together another five years. And well, we gosh, at one point there, we uh, Lauren Miller at the Edelweiss had us uh, be his band for two consecutive years for Oktoberfest. You know, he really? alternate program. This is so fun to know. Yeah, he alternate programmed, and we were the band there. And uh, the guys at Labatt's, Ernie <clears throat> Bazaire, who was the guy at the time, he loved us, and we would go down and play at the the Kuntz House at the time, which I believe is a funeral home now at the, in Waterloo. And uh, we played the closing of Oktoberfest on King Street and Kitchener one night. We would always play at this we played at, we played at Sports World many 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 times, and that's how the name the power of shoe came about because i at the time i lived on shoe avenue in kitchener so shoe being spelled s-h-u-h and i was doing these commercials on tv for sports world and their kind of catchphrase was are you ready for the power of fun so we just changed that to are you ready for the power of shoe, because it's the street I lived on. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was the most appropriate street name, uh, you know. If the, so there we go. That's and, wicked. Yeah, we did that, I think, for, oh, gosh, we played a guy's wedding out in, in Baden. Uh, you know, we had this tent, and it was like 600 it's people. So and, 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 and Lisa was in your band? Lisa was a singer. Oh, and she's a, she's, a, she's She's on the news giving you yeah. the, the most crucial stories yes. of the day. Yeah. And then she goes out and she plays at a party. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Like we played uh, Glenn Smith from Ethel's. You know, I don't know, you know, Ethel's Tavern. Ethel's, yeah, uh, Ethel's yeah. Lounge. Glenn was a big fan. I mean, we used to do, again, we would do some, we do these events. Yeah, we do these events. At the, we play at the Polish Legion in Kitchener and Glenn would be out in the back with a bottle of Jack for me. We'd go back out there and have that. And like, we had the TPTP rule and we told people this right off the bat. We would go till we were too pissed to play. And then uh, <laughs> we would end. Like we ended one gig one night when, um, so there's Mustang Sally and Midnight Hour. So the thing about Lisa was, and, and I'm not telling stories out of thing here, is that Lisa can't yeah. count, or at least count in. And so, you know, almost before every song, she'd just look over at one of the guitar players, and he'd nod, and she'd start singing. And then she didn't have a problem the rest of the way. So we were, <laughs> we were playing uh, Midnight Hour one night, or we started in the Midnight Hour. It was very late, probably way past the Midnight Hour. Lisa starts singing Mustang Sally. So... Uh, <laughs> So we Amazing. we get about we get about a verse into it and call it. <laughs> <laughs> That's Thanks awesome. for coming. But we, I mean, for I mean, all those guys worked at CKCO. Yeah, we were all very close. Uh, you know, and we just had a blast. What dude. did Bailey play? Dan was the keyboard guy. Oh, he was. And he sang oh. a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Did, Did he we? rest his balls on those keys? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I yeah. actually think that's how he may have played. I now I don't I believe it. I believe <laughs> just it. The, just the bass. Yeah, just I do yeah. believe it. <laughs> so, Did we? Did he mention that he played the piano on the podcast? I think it's a keyboard mm, more than a piano. Yeah. But yeah, he might have. Uh, I can't remember. I don't remember. Wow, the secrets he was I keeping. Can't he kept yeah. that in. I, I, I guess he would. And, and I'll tell you what he was. Of course, you know, he's a great videographer, as you know. Absolutely. I mean, we <laughs> at one point, gosh, I don't know. Maybe it was ten years ago. You lose track of time. But he presented me with with a shoebox, an S H U H box. And in it was all the video he'd ever shot of us, and he shot a lot. Okay, like so he that shot was my a lot question. of video. Yeah, well, you, wow. oh, you can't transfer that crap now. 
There's there's video of this. Oh, there's this. video. There's video. Wow. Yeah. So he, but he, he, I always thought, you know, what are you doing? But now I realize he was so far ahead of his time in chronicling. He was just, he was just documenting everything he was doing. Like even back then, his mind, like he would yeah. set up a, a, a camera just kind of off to the side that, and, and it'd be one shot. And and we'd be playing, and then you know we go back and listen to it after, but the sound. Was I think he has a, everything. He, oh, he did, yeah. His whole life. He, yeah, and he for he, sure. When he did the the podcaster, he sent me so much video. Oh my god! Yeah. I wanted to call him and say, "Danny, stop." <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Like, you're filling my computer up with video. Like he, if you follow him on Facebook, I mean, and there's a CKCO uh, TV page on Facebook too. Dan comes up with the most random stuff that yeah, I that's always posting that I'd never seen. Yeah. He's posted stuff with me in it that I've never seen. And quite huh. frankly, it would probably wouldn't be better if I, <laughs> you know you <laughs> the older you get, the better you were. So uh <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah, that's I like that. That's where I am right now. So uh, yeah, no, it was, it was good. This well, guy. you know, considering uh Lisa's uh situation now, I guess the band's getting back together. Well, uh yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> It you know it was uh, it, 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 we tried to get back together at the fiftieth anniversary. Oh and, really? For CKCO, and I think that would have been ninety, two thousand four, and it was at the uh, it was at the Waterloo Inn, and so they brought it. It wasn't Glass Tiger, but Alan Frew was. Oh. Alan playing, he was the lead singer for Glass Tiger. Oh okay, okay. <clears throat> and Alan, Alan. Uh, I was never keen on this suggestion to begin with, but a lot of the oh. a lot of the people there wanted the guys in the band to go up and play a song, and we were missing a guy, and you know, but oh I was there, God. Lisa was there, the bass player was there, uh, one of the guitarists was there, and then another another guy volunteered to be another guitarist, and so we went up, and I think we played. I saw her standing there. There's no <laughs> video of that, <laughs> thank gosh. But wow. I remember there's no video. No, of that? but I remember Alan Frew coming up, and he was pissed <laughs> because first we absolutely sucked because we were all <laughs> hammered, and then he and people were cheering, and he, we were getting a bigger response than poor Alan Frew. Played. But oh my anyway, God. so that has that's the only reunion. So <laughs> that is the one and only. Oh. No, I went up to Lisa's. Uh, she had a birthday party at her cottage, and I went up there, and, and she, uh, I guess that's about nine years ago. So I sat in, and she was singing. And so this is such a weird night because Lloyd Robertson sang Song Sung Blue by Neil Diamond almost note for note. Really? So, yes. Wow. But I think that's the last time I actually kind of did anything in terms of that. So now that's a video. That's I'd cool. Like to have seen. <laughs> it, was pretty, yeah. it was pretty weird. I'll tell you that. <laughs> that's yeah. Crazy. I mean, speaking just, just a thought, just speaking of Lisa, that right there, like it's, it's moments like that, uh, with her, uh, uh, being forced off the station and blindsided for sure. and all that, that, yeah. that, that to me seems like a pinnacle moment for all this, the, the way the, the old world versus the new. I can tell you that they 100% did thought, their mentality was, I mean, yeah, to, so when CTV, earlier I talked about the passion and the vision that the C, so CTV was a corporation of 5,000 people across the country. And when we were purchased by Bell, we became 65 or 70,000. And you know what that does? That just makes you another number on the, on the wall. Right. And so they never, they're, they, when they busted out Canada M, and they announced your morning the following Monday. That forever bruised the launch of that show. They yeah. took it in the because people were so pissed at Canada Am. They thought when mm. Lisa uh, they made the switch that that would die down in maybe a week or two. Quite they frankly, really it still that? hasn't. Oh yeah, for sure. Oh for sure. And it still hasn't died down now. And they they on top of all that. Uh, and I have a lot of respect for Omar Sachadina. I worked with him uh, on Canada M when we went, uh, when we did a failed six hour show. But uh, he, he, then they forced him one hour after Lisa put her video out to say, uh, so proud to be stepping in the shoes following the likes of Lloyd and Harvey Kirk without even mentioning Lisa. But he was put in an impossible position. Then they put him on all the local newscasts the same night. And so they. They just misgaged, but I think the, I mean, I got to stop here and say this. They don't care. 
So that's obvious. Like, they don't care. They maybe misgage something, but, you know... Uh, they move on. They move on. So, you know, there was a petition in the Globe and Mail, which was, they don't care. They, and Murray signed this, but Jan, like, all the, like, politicians <clears throat> all signed this politician, all signed this email, or this, this, uh, yeah, this letter about Lisa. And of course, I think a little, you know, what it did do, and I think Lisa would tell you that it has brought up the, the, uh, the issue of ageism in the workplace, of the way women are treated in the workplace. And sure. she's, she's so right about this. I mean, you know, uh, her and a producer were uh, um, uh, identified by a, a, a one news writer, Brian Lilly from the Toronto Sun, as uh, all the people in the newsroom, they were said they were mean girls. Why? Well, because, but if that were two men, they would say, well, these guys were really assertive and knew what they wanted. 100%. If it's two women, they're mean girls. And, and sure. so and <clears throat> that's the thing. That and Lisa is doing a spectacular job now. Of first of all, she's got great projects in uh, supporting women from Afghanistan and the Canadian Human Journalism for Human Rights, mm -hmm. and she's been to Africa and, and to try to mentor people over there. But I think at the end of the day, well, I do believe it was an eighty to eighty-five percent money issue. The little fifteen percent there uh, really has brought it, it. It wasn't a Me Too moment for Canadian news, but it was another moment in that area which pointed out the perils of being a woman in broadcast, no matter how long you'd been a woman in broadcast. And she's very passionate about that, remains very passionate, has done a lot of stuff speaking about that. And she's got now, you know, I'm, she didn't want to leave when she did, I'm sure, but it's funny, like in everything, right? I mean, this new door has opened and uh, she's become a, a very le legitimate is, isn't even the word. She's become the most powerful asset right now for working women and, and getting the plight of what's going on out there in the public because it's been going on for years and years and years. But and I do love that mean girl saying, you know, if, if two males are doing it, oh yeah, they're you know, very 100%. assertive and know what they want. If two women do it, oh, they're mean girls. Totally. Yeah. 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 And if she ever did this podcast, all I'd want to talk about is the power of shoe. Yeah, yeah, that's totally. it's, it's, to be me, the only reason all, to have her I on. Think, I think. I, think yeah. awesome. I can't imagine. Yeah. Why don't you talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> she did go on. I think she did do one podcast, which was um, Katie Couric's podcast. Okay. And, okay. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, if I'm her, I mean, I, um, I did an event with her. Um, the Canadian Federation of Women did an event in April here, and they were honoring Lisa, and it was arranged pre, uh, pre-COVID. And uh, so they ended up doing it last March and uh, unbeknownst to her I flew in from PEI with Heather and uh, just as they were about to sit down for dinner after all the people had spoke uh, one of the ladies who were running the event came on and said oh and by the way Lisa um, our moderator tonight isn't who you think he's coming all the way from PEI and you can hear her <laughs> on the tape gasp and go no oh, and really? then we kind of <clears throat> walked in Aww. And then, uh, then I ended up doing, we sat down just like this for 45 minutes, talked about the power shoe, about our days in Kitchener, about all these issues that she's so passionate about. I think we talked 45 or 50 minutes and it was just like this. I didn't even pull out a note. We, like I had nothing. We just talked and that was it. And we, it was mesmerizing. So that's the kind of thing now that she's able to do, but she's doing that on a, a larger scale, mm. but she can still pick and choose, right? I mean, there's nothing like, I, she's not the kind of person you're going to see go talking to, uh, you know, GM or you know, anything like that. I, I think she knows what she, or she's had a good year to figure out what she wants to do. So, and I, I don't think I'm, yeah, no, I'm pretty sure at all this. I'm not putting any words in her mouth. She's, she's just, uh, I'm actually, we're going to see her on Thursday. So I'll be checking in again. Oh, there. That's, it was the greatest awesome. surprise when we walked in though. I mean, that was a, uh, that was unbelievable because she had no idea we were coming. That's nice. So we just kind of flew up and did it. It was great. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to do. And of course huh. she, you know, um, no one ever accused her uh, or me, you know, of saying uh, no to a beverage after an event. And so there we are sitting in the TPTP. TPTP. I love that. <laughs> yeah. well, well, this was TPTT, too pissed to talk. But so whatever it was, what's the hotel that used to be the, the Hall of Anyway, Double Tree is it now in town by the Charcoal Steakhouse uh, or by Del Dante's? Anyway, whatever, that's where we were. And so, oh my God, we were with some, we were with, wow, this 12 passenger van is, we, we were there with the, the parents of the people who own the 12 passenger van. So they, uh, they drove us home. It was like quarter to one, one thirty, 
and I had to get up at six and go to my granddaughter's Canadian National Cheerleading Championships at Niagara Falls the next oh, wow. morning at six. So she's six. <laughs> she was just turned seven. You ever been to a Canadian National Cheerleading Championship? No. No. Boom! 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 So I, it, the, <laughs> the, it's just that's what exactly what happened. The music is you're sitting there. Lots of fill. I got a headache, and they walk into this room, and it is like, it is like, you know, uh, Megadeth, and the, the Foo Fighters are having a loud off. Yeah, and that, baby, that's where I'm at. That's what's going on. <laughs> oh my God, it was unbelievable. And how'd you do? Sweet. They were good. They, you know, the way they, the way they judge that is, it, you are excellent, superior, or like they don't. There's three different things, but you can't outsmart a seven year old. They know that superior is the best, and they were only excellent, and they're pissed. Oh, that's like, hilarious. They, they, they don't give them like an A, B, or C or a hundred ninety. They have these three words, but oh. I don't know. They, they're pretty smart. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> we, we had a friend of ours here, Mariah Owen. She's a, a film producer. And she, that's what she, her sport. It's cheerleading. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. yeah it's, was... you know, I'd never been introduced to it. And, and my stepkids all played hockey. And, and my own kids really didn't get into it like they did. And, you know, it's uh, it's just the same thing. I mean, it's it's teams. It's, it's uh, cheer parents. It's, yeah. And it's huge. Well, you don't it's realize huge. how big it is until oh. you, like, get into it. Oh, and you go, oh I, had, wow. I really had no idea yeah. until Mariah uh, until she, until she, Mariah yeah, spoke, she about spoke about it. Yeah, yeah. like 5,000 mm. people at this thing in Niagara Falls from across the country doing cheerleading. And I think it's because we aren't, like, we're exposed. If, you're, if your kids are playing hockey, then you're in that realm. If your kids are playing baseball or soccer, sure. you're in that realm. And you know all about <clears> it. Uh, you know, if your kids are cheering, and it, I mean, I'm guessing now that there, there must be some kind of cheer sport in PEI. I don't know. I, there might be. Well, we only have so we have so few people to choose from, as you know. So yeah, they might be the that one that, girl. That's right. it. Might be <laughs> exactly. And now my sport was skateboarding. <clears throat> right. I, don't, I don't really even consider it a sport. Some people say it's a sport or a game or something, but I I think of it as like a fiddle thing, like the way you might fiddle with a pen. I just do it with my right. feet. Yeah, it's yeah, kind of yeah. like that. Um, but it's now in the in the Olympics. Well, I was gonna say pen fiddling is not in the Olympics, my friend. No, it's not. Some, someday, but but keep, keep <laughs> going. Keep, keep I'm going. hoping, man. Keep going. <laughs> but you know, even skateboarding's getting there. It's like, just, you know what? You know, all this stuff though for the kids and for you, I'm sure it's just a release of some sort. Like it's a release of something. Like a, it, it takes you somewhere else other than where you, and where do you, you are. You know why they need that? Because oh. they're not watching morning news. They are not That's watching true. morning news. And good on them. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Yeah, no, no. That's, oh, listen. <laughs> no, do you know what? I mean, I, if, I, Heather and I were talking about this the other day. So when I left, I specifically remember saying to her, and she remembers, and I said, TV as we know it now won't be the same in 10 years. And we are, I think we're, you know, halfway there. Because everything will be streamed or, you know, in PEI, uh, so Chorus Entertainment mm -hmm. um, and Eastlink. So they're our cable company, like they're our Rogers type thing. Okay. So they just came, they had a dispute over how much uh, Chorus wanted to charge Eastlink to carry 37 channels. They never came to agreement. They dropped all the 37 channels. So we don't get HGTV now. We don't get like, there's, oh, it's unbelievable. But the hmm. option for that now are the chill TVs or stack TV, you know, all, right. So, right all these apps that that's you can right. get that's, and that's where they're going. So uh, that's what I mean. I mean, to me, CBC gem or CD, you know, pretty soon, if you do want to watch your local news, when I say pretty soon, I'm thinking five years, you will have to, you know, just app and watch it on an app or, you know, cast your TV or whatever, but TV per yeah. se, this has been one of the big issues with CTV, at least as Bell sees it, and, and if you talk to anybody who was a manager at CTV. So, for example, if you're a specialty channel, okay, TSN specialty, HGTV specialty, uh, you know, uh, Life Channel specialty, because they're all specialty channels. So the cable companies pay them to carry their, to carry their package on cable because there's no over-the-air option, which you have with... So over-the-air meaning stations used to be able to get with an antenna. Mm -hmm. Like Kitchener was over-the-air. So, and in TSN's case, it's tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars a year up front to have the right to carry TSN. And then TSN now is selling their TSN streaming package for 50 bucks for four months. So they're just making money hand over fist there. It's never enough, though, for Bell, but anyway. So a lot, for a long time, the, the local stations, and I mean CBC, CTV, Rogers, they had petitioned the CRTC to... Uh, allow them to charge the cable companies a fee to carry their signal. 
So for example, they're paying for TSN, yet all the local stations are delivering their viewers to that cable company for free, and the cable company is monetizing that, but the local station got nothing. They just supplied the signal. So oh. they're, yeah, so, so well, TSN, you, you, they get paid by the cable companies. CKCO, CTV Kitchener, does not get paid by the cable companies, yet they're carrying the signal. And the argument is, well, you know, that one lady out in Plattsville who's still got the rabbit ears can get can still get it. Like it's not a, you know, but 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 look at the, that's worth of satellite TV. It, just the way it's just the way the industry has gone over this tidal wave of change, and some things have kept up and some things have. Mm. I personally think that's a legitimate beef, <clears throat> but um, you know that ship has sailed now anyway. So well, I mean, okay. you know, uh, a lot of the attention span thing is a is a is a big mm. thing now. You know, um, if, if people look up and you know some information on the internet and they get an article that uh, has too big an intro you know and they don't get to the point it's like what am i doing and they just search for something else um you know, right i mean i mean that seems to be what's happening and and you know now we have um screen actors guild and the writers right. guild uh, yeah. on strike and uh, as, and a lot of this has to do with technology yeah. and that wave AI, you're right? about. Like, yeah. yeah they're worried about nobody writing a script but yeah. there's a script Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You just yeah, you get a script, and then uh, the writer that you called in to do uh, the the next three months only has to do a week of editing. Yeah, that's you it. know on yeah. some script that some executive prefers or yeah. whatever. You know, um, it is. Yeah, I mean, I think that you'll just lift up your phone and you'll tell it that you want to see a movie starring Mel Gibson, but and it'll make it up. But looks like this <laughs> and looks like that. Exactly right. And it'll Give just me a movie show that it to you. Like, yeah. Yeah, like I, I don't think there's any room for even execs anymore. I was seeing um, actors, uh, and okay, you know, not Julia Roberts, or but actors have been posting online the residuals they were getting for streaming shows. Like it's point yeah, zero three cents. Like, yes, are you yes. kidding me? Yeah. yeah. So how can the this you know this whole thing of getting your craft for free that that doesn't cut it. Like that to me that like. I don't know what fair and equity is, but when I, I don't care if it reran once and you were in it, that's the whole thing about it. Yeah. People are watching these things. You know, how many times have you, and you guys have heard it all kinds of times, like the success of Flashpoint was because they had a great cast and the cast meshed and people became interested in the characters, right? Mm -hmm. Totally. And, and and when there's a connection between the viewer and the character, I don't care if you're a news person, if you're an actor, you're a team, it's that connection. And that connection is not free. That person has worked years to be able to develop the skills to make that connection. 100%. And basically now they're saying, here's 0.3 cents. I get it. That's one thing, but still, it's insulting. But we will be overloaded with crap and we won't want to watch it and the streaming services will fall and somehow my hopes and dreams are that we go back to rare good passionate independent work made by real artists who really hmm. want to push their stuff for the art i'm hoping i think it's going to happen the same year as the pen twiddling in the, yeah, in the olympics <laughs> yeah. it's a, but you know a lot of dreams i think uh, when okay now i'm a little bit into your area here but I think and I hope and pray that the public is smart enough to know when they're having shit thrown at them that isn't made by experts or made by craftsmen yeah. or made by artists or made by... I think the public's smart enough to see that. I think I'm most hoping. people ignore it until they're covered well, in it. Yeah. I'm kind of... There's so much... Uh, the other thing, too, is there's so much <laughs> out there, right? The, the, remember... Growing up, we got like twelve. I, I had a con, I had a box. We called it a converter. You That's pressed right. A, you got ten channels. If you press B, you got ten more. That was yeah. it. We got twenty <laughs> channels. It's true. And it had a wire goes to the television. Into the television. I used to That's spin in our the era. converter yeah. all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I used to. I had three well, channels. <laughs> we had, we had three channels. We had to actually get up and cross the room yeah. to change the knob oh, yeah, on, the yeah, on yeah. a TV this big. Yeah. It's oh, true. No. It's hundred percent true. But that's just an indication. I think. I think that technology. You know, uh, in the first part of our lives, you know, say from the 60s to the year 2000, even the year 95, kind of, that was the beginning of, but that was the beginning of saying, ooh, get a computer or do, do this. But, you know, from the new, from the millennia on, I mean, holy cow, it's just exploded. It's just one new thing totally. every day. You know, totally. it, it's unbelievable. It's But it's does, don't scary. you look back at like with the internet, the beginning of the internet and kind of go, wow, I wish that didn't happen. 
Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. But, there are days. But, there but, are days, yeah. You know, you know I, it's interesting, though, because how many, how many... My job became so much easier with the Internet, or at least with the access to the Internet. I mean, you know, you go back to... I went back to the days where I was. there was a newsroom, and this machine just stood in the corner, and here comes a story and it would type out on the, and you'd rip the paper off. Then you'd have to go <laughs> totally. But I mean, the, the, you know, when I remember spinning, watching the guys upstairs, show me highlights on two inch videotape, you know, the, the spool is this big and you know, now we're, you know, digital boom, boom, boom. See you later. I lived through all that. Yeah. And, but yeah, yeah, in fact, I can tell you, in, I think it was 95 or 96. This came right out of the blue, but CKCO, gave every employee who wanted it a $3,600 interest-free loan, which you could pay back over two or three years uh, so that everybody that worked at CKCO, and this was everybody, and I believe at that time there was probably over 208, 210, to buy a computer. They wanted to put computers in everybody. I always thought that was very, very advanced of them. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Like... Yeah. But And now, of course, <clears throat> yeah. they're on. They're right there. I yeah. could land on the... <laughs> <laughs> He's holding up his phone again. Um, you can that, land on the moon with this thing. Again. Yeah. Oh, is it? Oh, well, that's Heather. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's more technology in this than landed the first guys in the moon. That's it. That's that's, that's another, true. That's another story. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but hey, wow. Looking back. Yeah. What? Okay. So you grew up in Preston, yep. as I did. Yep. We all we went to the same places. Yep. We yep. walked the same streets. Yeah. What caused you to? want to do what you did you went to Conestoga College I did but you know so all of them I, I got um here's exactly what it was when I used to fall to sleep at night uh you know I had my bed had a little um hall, a shell, you know my little bed board had a little hole in it had a transistor ra or radio and there wasn't transistor but it was radio and I used to fall asleep at night listening to listening to the radio uh which what, what, must seem that? like a completely foreign concept to you, but so we would listen to, <laughs> but but back then at night, you could get these super stations like WABC out of New York or WCFL out of Chicago or WoWo out of Fort Wayne, Indiana, and especially the New York huh. and Chicago stations had these boss jocks like Cousin Brucey, and I used to listen to cousin Brucey and all these boss jocks uh, on the radio falling asleep. And then it's like, I was eight, nine and 10 years old then thinking, Oh my God, that's, that's for me. And then I used to walk from, uh, we lived at Westminster and Vine. So it's three blocks from the high school. I think it's, it was yeah, Wellington. It was like you, you lived five blocks yeah, from me. Guys, yeah. So it was Wellington and Vine until Cambridge came in and they uh -huh. changed it to Westminster. And I used to have to walk from there to Fifth Avenue for my piano lesson. So Fifth Avenue is just out by the Galt Country Club. And I would walk out there doing a um, radio show in my head. That's how I passed the time. And not only would I do the radio show, I would sing the songs. And if I had to, I'd make up songs. <laughs> so, but whoa. I, yeah, yeah, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, and, the, and so I was always interested in that. And, and, and I remember, uh, you know, get, my parents had a hi-fi and then I would get records and I'd be listening to the records. And then I got two rulers out and then I would start drumming on pillows. And, you know, and, and so I always had this thing about this kind of music and the guys who presented it. And so I went all through high school. And as you know, when I was in Preston High School, I did the morning announcements uh -huh. for years and years and years. Like uh -huh. one student would go up and I would do the morning announcements. At the radio station in huh. Kitchener, which doesn't exist now, they would have a, uh, Grantley, who was the <laughs> Grant Hoffman, went by the name of Grantley. Um, Canadian who, Bandstand. Canadian Bandstand. Who, <laughs> the video of Rush on Canadian Bandstand still exists. But so I would go up there and every now and then I would do, I could, oh my God, now I'm doing what I want to do. And he let me do a, Grant let me do a demo tape once and I sent it out to CFTJ here and got rejected and I was crushed. <laughs> CFTJ doesn't want me. And uh, so then I thought, well, I'll, I'll go to Conestoga College. So my dad at the time was an accounting <laughs> teacher at Conestoga College. So I got it in my mind that I would not go to Conestoga College because my dad was teaching there. Not realizing that the campus at Conestoga College, uh, not unlike Preston High School, was pretty damn big. And so I thought, you know what, I'm just going to go to Ryerson and take hotel, restaurant, and institutional administration for no apparent reason. And uh, <laughs> which I did. So I went down there, uh, moved to Toronto, uh, spent a year, um, and uh, halfway through the second year, as money was dwindling and basically had just 
lost complete interest, I thought, okay, I'm going to see if I'll, I'll go apply to Conestoga. But in the interim, I had worked on the campus radio station at Ryerson. So I had now I had a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, stuff to present with what I did. And uh, I wrote uh, some uh, news copy and everything to send to them. So uh, I ended up getting accepted in a, a class of 25 in, uh, I think it was 74 I started there. So, uh, and you know, I felt so fortunate even back then uh, because, you know, six, seven hundred people, that was the heyday of people wanting to get into radio and TV. So I, I felt really fortunate to get in. And then... Um, so even, even when I went there, I still wanted to be a radio guy. And the first, so CFRB in Toronto, which is now News Talk 1010, they had this program where they hired six, well, it was eight, it went down to six, and they were called Good News Reporters. And those, they were students from various, call, like the Fanshawe and Ryerson and, and all the, the students. And they would have eight, six, eight hundred apply for that. So I applied at the end of first year, and you were only supposed to apply at the end of second year. So anyway, I got a call um, that I didn't get in, that I was made the short list, but I didn't get in. And then some guy does not want to do it, so now I get in. Oh, okay. So now I'm at the end of my first year, and I'm a good news. And, and people like, you know, legendary people like, you know, Gordon Sinclair and Jack, all these huge radio guys are checking my copy. So I became a pretty good writer pretty quick. And then I came back to uh, uh, Conestoga in the second year and still had that whole... I want to be a radio disc jockey. And then um, uh, Mark Hebsher, uh, I went to school with Mark Hebsher, the former sports line guy. And, okay. uh, yeah. So he uh, was going in and writing sports for Wayne Coyman at CKCO. And uh, Mark left school early to get because he got a job. And so I went down to CKCO uh, to get this job. And what the job was back then was writing Wayne Coyman's uh, evening sportscast. And the reason they had that person is because Wayne started as an announcer, and they, on CKKW they moved him down to do sports, and uh, he, like he had he, he had no experience in writing or anything. He was an announcer and a damn good one, and so I would go in and write his copy. Wow! And then that all of a sudden now it's uh, Bill Lincoln's going. Hey, do you want to go and do a report? So now I'm out there doing a report at the Brantford Alexander's hockey game, and I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, whatever. And so um, by the end of my second year, um, I somehow became the weekend sports anchor at CKCO. So I spent the third year at Conestoga College. I was going to Conestoga College full-time, and I was working at CKCO full-time. So I had a full-time job already. But my thought process was, okay... I already screwed the pooch for two years at Ryerson. I'm not going to go another two years and not get a piece of paper. Not ah. that the piece of paper, mm. it was. I think it was probably just even more for my parents. I mean, I, as you know, I mean, every job falls down to, at the end of the day, how good you are. Exactly. Like that, every job falls down to that. And you didn't know the future at that time, really. Oh, well, no. I, know? I, but I, I, no. And I thought, well, I, I, sh I get So I ended up uh, getting what they called early graduation. And, and so I only went September to, I think, end of January. And then off I went to CKCO. And then I spent 10 years uh, being the weekend sports guy at CKCO and reporting. So that, it, it, and uh, it was, I don't know. I mean, I think it wasn't until I started doing the, the writing that I sort of gave up the dream of listening to these boss jocks, they called them. Like, you know, CKLW out of Windsor. I still call up on, to this day, I'll go to YouTube and call up some of these old air checks from these guys. And really? I'm, I'm just amazed at them. I, it was such an art. It's, it's not so much an art now because everything's computerized. It's computerized. You sure. know, I mean, you got a guy, you got one guy uh, doing 15 morning shows in Alberta, you know? So like the, the Charlottetown, one of the, so Charlottetown has like four radio stations, but one of the morning teams is based in Ottawa. So. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Huh. Yeah. And like I said, there's a the there's one guy who does fifteen show fifteen morning shows in the radio stations in Alberta, so that's where that's going too. You know the the, the art of being a great communicator, yeah. Which is what I think. You know there are great communicators, and and I've always considered myself a pretty good communicator. And I think one of the things when I was at uh, Kitchener, I did play by play of the um, 
you know, we did some basketball play by play and I did junior B hockey play by play. Uh, and I, it, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was learning how to ad lib. And so, um, you know, in the over 23,000 weather forecasts I did. 20, wow. 23, over 23,000. Yeah. I, uh, th- that's in my numbers chat I was talking about earlier. But I never used a, ever had a, I didn't have a prompter and I didn't have anybody telling me. It all reverted back to how I used to study. So when I would study for a test, I would go in and write everything down. I could just remember it or what I'd written down, and that's what I'd do. So in the mornings, I would go in, I'd prepare, I'd write down all the salient points and everything. I'd read them over, and then I'd just remember them. So, I mean, I did weather uh, for Canada AM. I was on a roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland once doing the weather. The coaster's going like this, and I'm, oh, well, I'm that doing makes the sense. weather. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I'm doing the weather. You get, <laughs> Jesus. Oh, yeah. I was playing drums. Uh, for an Irish band on George Street in St. John's for a St. Patrick's Day remote. And you know what I was doing? The weather. No way. Oh, yeah. I'm keeping time doing the weather. (laughs) That's amazing. I'm not sure either of them were correct, but (laughs) no. So, I mean, and that's the kind of fun, you know, again, that's the whole Canada M thing. There isn't a part of the country I haven't seen. So it was was great. But it's just the ability. But again, it's being a communicator. And in my... And you could take guys like Rod Black, who did a year on Canada M, but he was always a sports guy. Great ad libber. Dan Matheson, great ad libber. You know, if you <laughs> if you can be a great ad libber, because I work with a lot of guys who, unless it's right in front of them, you know, unless it's right there, they're great at delivering, but to go off script, as we say, you know, they, sure. they couldn't do it. And I spent a career hardly ever on script, and I was more than comfortable with it. More than comfortable. Man, well, right that's on. why you became yeah, who, who yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. years of practice. <laughs> so, but no, it was part of the reason that I could ad lib. That when I went down to Canada M, um, so I had worked the '88 Olympics with Dan Matheson and a lady by the name of Wendy Day, who at that time was the executive producer of Canada AM, uh, called me and said, "Dan has suggested that you might be a great fill-in uh, for him when he goes to Barcelona." Uh, would you like to come down and talk about it? I said, sure. She said, okay. And she set a date three weeks later. Well, I go walking in and Wendy Day's been fired. So now, oh, no. <laughs> so now, so now I go walking in and uh, a lady who, by the name of Ann Kerr is there. By the way, those are the first two of 13 executive producers I went through at Canada. So anyway, I walk in and there's Ann Kerr mm-hmm. sitting in there. And, uh, and this was 1992. And I'll give you... I don't generally do this, and I'm I, I'm just telling you this dollar figure because of how much it shocked me, and it probably isn't that big of a deal. But so she's sitting there, she's sitting there, and she goes, "Oh, so you're going to fill in for Dan?" End of interview. Okay, yes, I will. Like there was no, there was no nothing. She said, "So you're going to fill in for Dan?" Okay, yep. Like I knew not to say. Whoa, wait, aren't you going to? I said, "Yeah, I am." And she said, "Okay, um, you know what? I am just going to see. Hang on, I'll be right back." So now I'm sitting in her office. She's gone for like 15 minutes and she comes back and she goes, so I hope this is okay, but the pay is 464. And I said, so in my mind, I'm going, okay, I know what I'm making a week at CKCO. It's clearly more than that, but the opportunity, a day. Oh, okay. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. So, so a day, I mean, you had me at a day. So that, I mean, that story, that, that, that I thought, oh boy, I'm not in Kansas anymore now. And that, Damn. but that right there, that's why for five years, and I luckily became the go-to guy for filling in for the next five years because I, I had fun that summer. Oh, and by the way, at the end of that summer, uh, Ann Kerr, who was still there, came up to me and said, you know, I'd never seen you on the air before I hired you, but you're pretty good. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, how can you even put somebody on the air at a national level that you'd never even seen on the air. Well, how does this sounds person crazy. get that job? Well, that's exa- well, and again, did not have it for long. Um, oh, okay. I'm hoping I wasn't the cause. But it would be nothing <laughs> for me for three weeks at a time, and this was during a five-year period, that uh, I would get up at three in the morning, uh, drive to Toronto to get there uh, about 4, 4.15, prep Canada AM, do Canada AM. Back then, it was from 6.30 to 9, and we had various... Our last incarnation was 6 to 9, but we did go to 10. And then I would drive back in the car, do the noon and the 6 here in Kitchener, go home, go to bed, get up at 3, drive back down. I would do that for three weeks at a time. 
And and at that at that time, I mean, I was only doing it because of the money. I yeah, mean, that's totally. no, exactly. That's why I was doing it. And um, but it kept going on and on and on. And then finally, uh, I think it, when I did take uh, in, I, I was getting a little stale. I think at CKCO, so uh, I got a the Rogers people in town here, which is now I think it's still News Talk five seventy. I don't know what they call it. By the news, the news station in Kitchener. Oh, I couldn't tell you. No, so I ended up leaving CKCO for one year, less than a year, uh, to do the morning show when they launched that show in 1997, and that was quite possibly the most, the worst year of my life. I mean, there just was a lot of, uh, I don't know what's the right word for it. I guess things that were promised weren't delivered uh, you know I, I found myself working on christmas day after being in the business for 25 years and there was no mm, way out and and, okay. and you know all of a sudden different things so thank god i got a call to do canada am um man maybe six months in and i didn't I, I just went to my lawyer and i said so can i get out of this and she she's going well you know and and so they at uh, Rogers at the time made up this story. They let me go. They had a guy they were bringing in. They knew they they floated it out there that I was hard to manage, and that's why I was leaving, and, really? and so on and so forth. But they were so um, the consultants at that point in radio were just overbearing. Like they were just it. You go. Oh, you just. I remember there's a famous Seinfeld episode where they're talking about someone horked a loogie. Right. Oh yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. I believe it's the yeah. I hit him. Yeah. In, I believe it's the I believe it's the Kennedy parody or whatever. So I remember <gasps> saying one day uh, that uh, oh my god, that was so funny. I almost horked a loogie. Now I get called into the uh, program director's office. Going, you can never say horked a loogie. I said, I said it's on TV. You can never say horked a loogie. You could never say hork a loogie. And I, okay. And so I knew right there that this was not the job for me. Can anyway. We, can we say that on the podcast? Uh, well, I it's think pretty gross. Hork. Yeah. Hork yeah. is a bad word. Yeah. Yeah. Loogie. <laughs> yeah, loogie hilarious. Right, yeah. Cause I almost horked a loogie when <laughs> that, you said that, it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so thank God that, that I look at that as my gap year, <laughs> my eight months of radio kind of as my gap year. And then Canada M came calling and it was funny cause <laughs> it was almost at the point where I didn't think Canada M was ever going to happen. And then I was getting a little frustrated in Kitchener because I, Again, I mean, so I had applied to be the assistant news director there thinking, okay, well, I, I can't keep doing sports. And then the news director told me that people wouldn't accept a sports person in the news role. <laughs> Going right back to... With well, the weather. And that, no, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Which, There's you know, a lot of pigeonholing here. Well, yeah. it is. Like, man, I mean, it's crazy. So I was pretty... Um, and I don't know Sid Sex there. I remember he used to be on... Uh, did you ever... On, uh, he was with Tim and Sid on... Uh, okay, yeah. sure. So anyway, but he left that Tim and Sid show to become the morning guy on City's morning show. I thought that was one of the great moves ever. Huh. Because this is a guy who took himself out of the sports realm at, you know, probably 41, 42... And thought, you know what? I need a. I want a career path that's going to lead me in a different direction. Right. So I'm always glad to see, you know, whether or not you like or, or not like, but agree or disagree with the guy, what the guy's saying. I always like to see a guy get out of sports, go to something else. And the, the greatest thing ever is they accept it. And I was always so lucky because I did jump in between seats several times, you know, that it, it got to the point where, you know, I would just be the default host guy and they'd bring a weather person in. And I was accepted if I was sitting in the host chair interviewing the, you know, defense minister of defense minister of Israel, as I was, you know, uh, having a camel bring up on my arm at the Calgary Zoo, that's how that's how comfortable I was. Still working and losing. Yeah, still working yeah, yeah. and I see how it's what I did there. <laughs> that was one of the grossest things that ever happened to me. And no one knows this is my loogie cup. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So well, go. No, I was going to say. Uh, who else have you interviewed? Like, oh, you know, I, I, I always get here. If I'm in conversation, if I'm, you know, I'm talking to people and, and people say, oh, what was your greatest interview? And you right. think, I think oh, you, uh, there's so many, you can't remember them. But say if you're at a party or you're at a bar and then some uh, conversation happens. I mean, some of the ones I remember doing, uh, I went down to, uh, and keep in mind, not being a host, like a lot of the, but I did a lot, a lot. I remember I went down to the uh, to Miami to where the Bee Gees studio was and interviewed all three of them mm -hmm. before they were doing a one night only thing on A and E. So I interviewed all three of them, you know. And this was uh, 
prior to everybody having a phone and i remember barry gibb we were in there and the three of them were there this is of course before morris passed away but barry gibb i mean we go walking in come shakes your hand shakes the cameraman's hand shakes the producer's hand shakes my hand gives us all you know all the pr people are going well you got 15 minutes you know like at the 40 minute mark i'm i'm going like this going well we're never going to use all this <laughs> but anyway and so ended stood up would you like a picture unfortunately no we didn't have a camera but that's how generous they were i went down and did um garth brooks in nashville one month after 9 11. Wow. he was yeah he was releasing a new album i'll never forget this one because we uh there was there was uh some guy from the country cma or the country channel here cmt and myself and one other person, and they put us in this room to listen to his new release. So we're sitting in a room, it's not unlike this, but full of speakers, and we're sitting there listening to it, and I'm going, well, something is really off here. And we're just looking at each other, and about the third song in, his manager comes in and says, sorry, we were playing that at the wrong speed. <laughs> so it was, oh. I thought I was here for a Chipmunks concert. So, <laughs> <laughs> so then we all listened, and then Garth Brooks comes in, sits down, all the time. Like Hi, guys. Just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, it's a, yeah. <laughs> so that's gross. And I, uh, I, you know, so I, I did people like Tim McGraw and Faith Hill. And, and uh, you know, I, I did an interview with Jack Very Nicholas cool. once, who was sort of a, a, a I'm a golf or like golfing. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and so uh, this interview came with Jack Nicholas. And I remember there are different kinds of golf balls. And I remember our producer said, we got to get a golf ball with the Canada M logo on to give to Jack. I said, don't do that. I knew right away this was, I said, don't do that. Don't do that. I, she said, why? I said, well, you know, I said, first of all, you know, he's Jack Nicholas. Uh, secondly, I'm sure he gets all the free golf balls he wants. And, <laughs> and be, I, I said, I don't think he's going to put a Canada M logo, you know, on his wall or what would he do with it or blah, blah, blah. Sure enough, day of the shoot comes, we're going to, he's at a, a house, he's at a fundraiser at one of these mansions, you know, and so it was a private kind of thing. So sure enough, she shows up and she's got a box of Callaway Warbirds. So a Warbird, <laughs> a Warbird, it wouldn't be the worst golf ball out there, but if you stood on your tippy toes, it wouldn't be hard to, to see it. So, <laughs> so now he, I've got this Callaway, Callaway Warbird golf ball with the Canada AM logo on it. So the interview ends and I said, geez, thanks, Jack, and everything else. And the producer, she says, give him the ball, give him the ball. I said, I'm not giving him the ball. <laughs> She goes, give him the ball. I said, okay, I'll give him the ball. So I went back and I said, I said, Jack, um, listen, I said, I got a little golf ball here for you. It's got the Canada M logo on and uh, you kind of like to have, you have it, you know, you can do what you want with it. So he picks the ball up. I'm not kidding. He picks the ball up, he holds it in two fingers, turns it around and goes, hmm, Warbird, and hands it back to me. No way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> oh my God. Hmm. Warbird, <laughs> like what? So I remember that, you know that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, there's so many people oh went through there. God. You know, That's just so many people went. Like Tony Bennett went through, and the musical artists we had on that. I mean, Tina Turner, uh, you know, Adele, uh, Taylor Swift, <clears throat> uh, unreal. Yeah, uh, Diana Krall, um, Paul Anka. Like the 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 number of musical Mary Chapin Carpenter. Last week when we had this kind of Canada reunion, I was putting a playlist together of all the artists I could remember that had been on the show. Mm. I mean, we had some duds, but you had to take the duds <clears throat> to get the big ones. Sure. That's just how the record companies work. Sure, of course. But we had some great, I mean, I remember one day, the best artist ever on Canada was Amanda Marshall, beyond the shadow of a doubt. She sounded note for note. I'll never forget it. Really? But my cool. most surprising thing was, I was in there, so I used to get there about... Uh, uh, get up at quarter to four so I could be at work by I had to be at work by between 428 and 431 although that sounds a little <laughs> obsessive impulsive if I was one minute later for some reason my whole morning was thrown off hmm. and I remember I went I was going and I always was in makeup probably 530 to 540 so uh, I remember Paul Anka was performing and I thought oh, I'll just go in the studio and see his setup so I walked in the studio it is 540 and Paul Anka is in there directing his own rehearsal that's a pro that's a pro because generally and his his mm. segment wasn't till 8 45 so that's how much he thought of you know he wanted everything he ever did to be top notch mm -hmm. like that yeah. i can't i can't even think of <clears throat> two other people who did that. I, I just totally. you know people are still loading in sometimes at 5 30 and this guy's in there full orchestra um the, what he was promoting i don't 
<laughs> so he did a bunch of cover versions one time of like he did Van Halen's Jump and he did uh, so it, the, the songs are actually pretty cringe cringeworthy but um, <laughs> <laughs> well you just can't you just can't Paul and I, everybody jump <laughs> you get, that's awesome <laughs> but so yeah Jesus. and I'm sure like a hundred others will pop into my head but and the other thing was I was never like there are some people I never asked if I could have a picture taken with anybody. Um, but if they, if the producer was there, I said, if you do that, you have to check with their people. And then, uh, prior. You know, yeah. yeah. So I only have a handful. I'll same, say, same thing with us in, in the film business. We work with so many movies. Exactly. Stars, right. Say, Who did you work with? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I can't even come up with one. Yeah. I mean, you can, but yeah, it's a respect, the, though. the only picture I think, well, Chris Christopherson. Yeah. Oh, nice. Good one to have. And uh, Diane Weist. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I, again, remember I said I, I, there's only one other one I want to mention, sort of. And I did Pete Townsend. Uh, when, Sweet. Yeah. When Stratford did, uh, they did a, a version of Tommy, and so uh, they called us up and they said, you know, Pete Townsend's available. Will, will you come down and do him? And I, you know, and I was sort of the uh, Pop Just guy, come down and do them. <laughs> okay, you know. I mean, okay, they're selling everything now. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. So, again, it's these PR people. So yeah. the, the lady from the the uh, Stratford Festival is going. Okay, well, it's going to come in, and uh, he's going to be entering through that door. And we were sort of in one of the uh, um, offsite theaters. There's the main stage, and there's these little theaters around Stratford. So we were in there. He's going to come through that door, and uh, he's going to come in. He's going to sit down and. You know, do the interview, and you know what? If you, you know, eight, ten minutes max, a uh, busy guy, blah, blah, blah. Okay, no problem. So, uh, I'm sitting there, and uh, <laughs> so we're just, we're just standing there, waiting, waiting, waiting. And then some guy got a, like a, a satchel over his arm, got a coat over this arm, wearing a hat, comes strolling in. And I'm thinking, oh, here comes his manager. Well, it's Pete. <laughs> just right came on. strolling in. And you know what? Introduce himself to everybody. I talked to him for over half an hour and he would have kept going. He was delightful, engaging. And you know, it's like anything, you'll find that the, the best people to interview are people who, even though they've heard a question a hundred times, answer it like it's the very first time they've heard it. And that's what he did. I'm sure I didn't ask him anything that he hadn't. And that's the same with all these guys. You know, you, you have to try and kind of find an avenue to get in there. Sure. But, and, sure. but everybody's <clears throat> looking for an avenue to get in there to ask the question that, you know, lightens them up. Like, I did an interview with uh, Ben Affleck once and he was the, oh my God, that's just brutal. It was just, really? Av- really? Oh, it was, it didn't, it was, but it was these things, uh, you know, like a junket, right? So we were X number in line on a junket, meaning he was sitting in New York and I was in Toronto ah, and my yeah. turn came up and I tried to make a little small talk with him because there was something uh, about, him on the Drudge Report or something that humorous on there. Well, you know, Matt Drudge, you can write what he wants. I don't really, like, I didn't. And then it, it was just boom, boom, boom. So he was, I would huh. put him in, at the other end and. Interesting. Know, yeah. Wow. Yeah. But have usually you, people have, are. Have you ever had a, like an embarrassing moment? Something that it's you wish you didn't right do? Now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you know, I, I don't know. So, I don't know. It's just so, well, you know. There was, you know, live I, TV. I've had it. We used to, I have. I mean, we used to have a saying with us when I would go on remote and do all these things and we'd plan things. And, you know, I found out, hey, you don't let firecrackers off in front of horses. Like, who knew? Like, so, you know, that kind of thing. So, <laughs> totally, man. So, but I, so, um, you know, there were all kinds of things when we were doing live TV that we'd say, you know, if we plan this and it works, that's great. But if we plan it and it screws up, that's even better. So we had a lot of those moments, totally. but my worst gaffe on air was, I was, this was probably 98 or 99, because I think Dan Matheson and Valerie Pringle were the co-hosts, uh, Valerie for sure, and then Dan and Valerie. And I was at the Science Center and they were doing this, um, they had a thing on uh, life. You know, here's, put, put a picture of yourself. This, ooh, this was really big, but now I can, da- I can do this in one second, but now this is, hey, bring a picture, we're gonna put it in this machine, and then look up there on the big screen, and in eight minutes, It'll age you. Here's what you're going to look like when you're 40. Oh. <laughs> so it's that kind of thing, right? And it's like, you know, they got that big electron ball. Put your hand on it. Your hair all goes up. Go, Don't touch the hair. Okay? So, but, you know, put your hand on it and everything else. So then, <laughs> then they had this species meter. And it was counting the number of plants, animals, and organisms 
in the world. And the organisms were, they were all kind of dropping a bit, but it was a species, like, like a population clock okay, of species. Sure. So I was on the air, and Valerie was getting ready to interview Dr. Ruth Westheimer, the sex expert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Valerie comes on, and she says, you know, we're talking, 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 and we do a little talk back. And I said, oh, Val, before you go, I said, look, uh, hey, look at this clock here. I said, this is counting plants, animals, and orgasms. And she, <laughs> and she says, plants, animals, and what? I said, plants, animals, and orgasms. And I said, orgasms are going down. And she goes, well, everybody needs more of those. And then Dr. Ruth Westheimer is, is and I think at that time she was 70, yes. and she's on the floor of the studio. just. And I didn't even know. I, and then the crew's laughing, and I'm sitting there and going, what? And then, yeah. So That's I, I believe there's man. tape of that somewhere. That's hilarious. There has yeah. to be tape. There's of tape that. of that somewhere. I I've only ever seen it one one other time. But plant, plants, plants animals, animals, and orgasms. And orgasms. I mean, yeah. there's more than enough YouTube videos going around now of anchors messing up words and things like yeah. that. Or That's a good one. That that you know? that would have been my most kind of gotcha thing. It's funny, you know, when you you mention that stuff going around. I, I Kitchener, which I'm constantly amazed when Dan Bailey comes up with stuff, and we have another guy there. And, by the name of Bob Tiffin, who's running our kind of the Facebook page. I'm on C that Facebook page. Yeah, right and there. the CKCO history website. Mm -hmm. But people are always going, mm -hmm. I was on, you know, Big Al in two, uh, 20, or, you know, 1988, if you got, but they didn't keep everything. Like, it's so easy to keep everything with digital today because you can keep yeah. like five yeah. years worth of shows there. Yeah. But if you were keeping shows back then. You needed a warehouse. Well, each tape would have been like at least 18 inches mm -hmm. by 18 inches, yeah. but too deep. And, uh, you know, sure. and so just to keep everything, you're absolutely right. I remember uh, at CTV when I was there when they were beginning the process of moving everything from <laughs> two inch and one inch to digital. I mean, it was a massive, massive thing, but they did it. But that's kind of the thing I'm A, regret, B, am happy about. <laughs> yeah, they haven't <laughs> done so. You know, there's some stuff at the local level you just don't want coming back at you. Like every bowling episode, but... <laughs> <laughs> Those got to be on there though. Well, there's some on you. There's a few things on YouTube. Well, I'm... What kills me is that some people like have recorded this. You know, just everything they've just recorded. Yeah. I can't believe some of the stuff that you find on YouTube. The well, Dan Baileys of the world. They're the Dan, like video yeah, files, totally, right? They're, totally. Yeah, they're yeah. I know. I'm really surprised sometimes when like some guy. Um, there's a website called Retro Ontario, or and it, they'll run some CKCO stuff from time and time again. And, wow. you know, I'll see, like, commercials I did. I'm wearing a tuxedo selling a pool table in 1984. Like, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just weird to see. I don't ever fuck with those guys <laughs> at the billiards. <laughs> yeah, I, I, believe, I believe it was Sheerheart Billiards and Sheerheart okay. with a T. Yes. I saw, you know, because we used to do, we used to go to CKCO and they'd have a commercial run, right? So all the guys are right now. And it'd be nothing after dinner. You'd have to run upstairs and read 30 commercials, you know. Available at Walmart. Too. It, was kind of, you know, it was just, and all of them were 40 seconds long and you had 30 seconds to read them. Or the 15 second ones, they were 30 seconds long. That's why people talk fast on TV. People are just writing like crazy to get as much information as they can. Totally. <laughs> That's hilarious. So you wrote two books that I'm aware of? Well, I wrote a book called, yes. I mean, they're, they're more, um, uh, I guess, a coffee table book. So they were quite a chore to do them both. One was called The Best of Canada. And the other was uh, kind of a takeoff on that called The Best of Atlantic Canada. So in 2002, I got a text from a pub an email from a publisher in Ottawa saying, hey, I've been looking where you travel. Do you want to write a book on uh, Canada? I'll and I said, no. <laughs> so anyway, there we go. That was that. So I'm going to Ottawa to do a show. And uh, I check into the, we always stay at the Chateau Laurier. Somehow this guy knew this. And I check in, and the lady goes, oh, I have a box here for you from John, uh, the publisher. I, first of all, I go, so I open the box, and it's a <laughs> it's a photocopied book. So it's the every picture photocopied. See, a photocopier is a machine that we used to take things. <laughs> <laughs> do you notice how he does that? Yeah. yeah I do that, too. And somebody yeah. said, that's so funny. It's a Preston thing. Yeah, it's a Preston thing. Yeah, sure. well, do that. yeah Preston or... <laughs> he <laughs> sent me this 140-page photocopy book. Proof of concept, of, yes. brother. That's so awesome. I start going through the book, and I go, well, I've been there, I've been there, I've been there, I've been there, and, and I'd been to about 70% of the places. So I said, okay. Uh, so we strike up a deal to do this book, and then... You strike up a deal. The thing about agreeing to do it, like I, 
you know, I've now written one more book than I've read. So the thing about agreeing to do a book <laughs> is you actually have to write a book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's one thing to say, okay. So I'm thinking, oh my God. So the first couple weeks, I'm up in my little office and I'm writing away. Then the greatest thing on earth happened. I got called for jury duty. So I can't okay. be on a jury because being in the media, they think there's a bias, but they don't know that till they call you into the thing. So I took my little computer down to oh. jury duty, found myself a kiosk. I had five days at eight hours, bang that puppy out. Last day I go into the thing. We, no, we don't want this guy. I'm out of there. So a week off work to write the book, thanks to jury duty. Wicked. So I, wow. I think that book now has sold probably 65 or 70,000 copies. So I think that, Damn, that's but I don't bad. know if that, uh, yeah. And then the Atlanta Canada one, which is a bit of an offshoot, we changed it around, was specific to that area. So I think we sold 10 or 15 of those, but uh, yeah. The okay. funny thing about that book is it's still going. Like every, if you go into some chapters or some uh, Indigo, uh, that book can, is still there. It's still going. I think it's on its, uh, he then put out a French one, then put out a hardcover one, put out one with a new cover on. So now I think we're at, uh, I don't know, like the fifth or sixth edition of it. He sends me a case of books every now and then. Are you going to do another one? No, 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 gosh, no, 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 no. People keep asking me the, at this weekend we had with the Canada M people, the former president of CTV news asked me, are you going to write a book? And you know, I could write a book, but all the things that I know, I don't want to tell anybody. Like, (laughs) like I'm not, I don't want to write a book and you know, so I know some things that happened and people know yeah. some things that happened, but I'm not interested ever in sharing them. Like, why would I, why would I do that just for a book? You know, I don't so. know. You know, you're being in your position, you're in the know. No, I wasn't the know. Now, for, know? It's, it's like, first of all, you know, it's, it's great being the morning guy. Cause I was always going in there at, at four 30 in the morning and I generally be out there by 10 or 11. Uh, we didn't have a set eight hour day because we traveled so much. So we just, you know, and you just, sure. It all kind sure. of worked out. So I was lucky not to get caught up in a lot of the drama of, of the day-to-day goings on at CTV. Uh, I, okay. I, but sure. I did get caught up. I mean, people I knew, and I knew a lot of people there, they had their own drama. But, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's now you write a book on Canada AM, I'm seeing people like you were going, what's Canada AM? <laughs> what, <laughs> suppose, is, what is that exactly? I suppose that's true. That's true, yeah. So but being across the country and all this no, stuff, it was, I mean... No, it was good. I mean, at one point there, you know, I think they were back... What have we got now? 40 million in the country. I think at one point we were getting a million viewers a day. Now, that being that said, so the show would run from Ontario East Live, and then in Manitoba, it would be tape delayed, which would now be uh, yeah. now be called uh, time shifted. But, uh, you know, until to, it was uh, an hour there, two hours in Alberta, three hours in BC. So at... 6 30 when it started in bc it was really 9 30 here and you know so right. they would get it that way but no it was a powerhouse in its day we were always a little bit weaker in vancouver because that was always a strong tv market but it was a great show in its day and it you know i mean a million viewers a day is pretty, pretty good. Damn good i mean yeah. we you know you talk about bell and their their kind of uh disdain for news and the fact they can't make any money of it yet when they bought ctv for the second time, but they bought it also in 2000 and then the Thompson family and, and some people got together and bought it back. And then they sold it again. But when they sold it, they thought, you know what? We need to convince the CRTC in our application to buy CTV that we're going we're gonna to be good community citizens. So they said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to start six morning shows uh, in, uh, so where'd they do them? They did them in uh, Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Regina, Saskatoon, and Winnipeg. So they start these six morning shows. And of course that, and they keep Canada M going for the East and whatnot. But at the end of the day, they had no idea how much it cost to get a morning show up and running, nor, you know, the very thing they're complaining about now, the cost of news. Now, this is just one component of it, but they brought that completely on themselves by not doing, I believe, any due diligence in figuring out how much would six morning shows cost over 10 years because it's in the tens of millions mm. and you're never going to make the money back at that time. Cause a, the competition is too great. And B, you know, the demographics of the people who still watch morning shows are, you know, you got to skew that 45, 55 and older for sure. It, and it keeps getting older every day. So that's your demographic. Yeah. You know, if you watch the today show or the, any 
nightly news on American networks, ABC, you're seeing Ozempic advertised or something that, you know, the, all them are, all those ads Never are, about it. yeah, all those ads are designed for people 60 and above. Like it's all the, it's all the different medical ads. It's all the different pills you can get for, you know, fighting cancer or, or Zempic or this does this, you know, the ads where they go, you know, may cause internal bleeding, may cause death. You know? <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> I've got to say that, right? But you never see an ad for Coors Light on the NBC Nightly News. You never see an ad for, uh, you know, huh. a, a new car on the NBC because it's not their demo. Those ads are all in the football games, right? Mm -hmm. It's true enough. Th it's what it is. Yeah. Man, there's a science, isn't it? Yeah, big time. Don't forget, I just have to make you believe I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> true. <Whoa. laughs> true. Everything we're hearing today is complete false news. No, no, no. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Gosh. Now, see a guy in your position with uh, your name and your connections and all that you've had, you could do something crazy if you wanted to. You could tell the whole world about things on your own time with your own. You could have your own radio show. You know? well, I, could, I could finally help. You know what? I mean, <clears throat> I really think that. Uh, um, I'm a firm believer that uh, I had a spectacular run for me. I had a great career. I saw a lot of, I mean, I just traveled. I can go to Regina and give you directions from the airport to the hospital. I mean, I can go to Saskatoon and tell you exactly how to, like, I, I just had this great career. Very and cool. I just don't really, I'm kind of done that now. You know, I mean, I've been traveling. The thing was to travel. I mean, um, you know, pre-pandemic, of course, we all got the pandemic. You know, mm -hmm. you sit here thinking, boy, my wife and I are going to Italy in uh, nine days, apparently. Ten days? Oh, I hope it's ten. <laughs> You'll go when she tells you. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but we th we were last there in 2019, yeah. and we're staying at the exact same place. And uh, we were talking the other night. Well, we were just there a couple years ago, right? Well, it was 2019. But... 20, 21, 22 don't exist. We don't have any milestones. That's right. Right? Yeah. But at the same time, I got three years older. <clears throat> and honestly, I, I, I'm not sure I have the, um, the, and I love doing stuff like this. I love being invited. I, I think it's terrific. But I, I don't think I just have the will and, and desire anymore to, you know, do what I did. Like I, I was serious when I, I thought, okay, I'm not going to miss it anymore. And, uh, so I've done a, a couple of these podcasts, uh, you know, uh, different things, and but uh, and I still get asked every now and then to go speak at places. And I'll tell you how I, I'll tell you how I hmm. begin my uh, speeches when I'm speaking because um, I always say to people, "Hi, thanks for having me." I said, "Listen, uh, for the Canada AM folks out there, I said, as you know, one of my former co-hosts uh, is now the Federal Minister of Labor. I said another one of my former co-hosts is now the Federal Minister of Women, Youth, and Diversity." Uh, another one of my former co-hosts just received the Order of Canada last summer, and I'm here talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. So, and you know what? I win. So <laughs> it's just that it's, it's what it is. I mean, you know, that's Seamus and Marcy, of course, have gone into government, and, and they came out. Uh, well, Seamus came this year, but oh, my God, it was just terrible because, um, you know, I've known both them for over 20 years. Seamus, I know him for 20 years. He's a friend of mine. I mean, I don't base my friendships on whatever political party they happen to be exactly yeah and so we posted some pictures on social media of the four of us and we knew that uh we do know that whenever we post a picture of us uh people like that who are former viewers and there's a lot of them and they'll like it and they, we're not doing we just you know we just it's a fun thing to do well the the oh my god i, I had people telling me to uh be better because i had a picture of myself with seamus or regan I had picture people. I had half the province of Alberta, you know, uh, it, literally saying. I actually had to report some people, you know, saying, you know, the only thing that can make Seamus look better is a bullet and this kind of stuff, like the vitriol and that. That and these people aren't in my realm of people who I are friends or whatever you call them on social media. So this year we just didn't do it. It's not worth it to me. I can't. It's too overwhelming for me to see all this hate spewed at my two friends. Yeah. You know, who just happened to be in government, and, and that's just what it is. And I I did answer the guy who said, be better, because I looked up his thing, and it, mm. it was like father of three, blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know what? You need to be better. I said, because I've been friends with these people for 20 years, and I'm not basing any friendship on a political affiliation, mine or theirs. You be better. 
I don't even know if he's, but I just felt better for writing that. I, probably the only time, but it was just too much for me, you know, too. It's just, I, it's unbelievable. No wonder nobody runs for public office anymore. The, you know, yeah. quality people, because it, you're, A, you're under a microscope. You know, if you, if you hork the loogie in grade nine, it's on YouTube. And then somebody, you know, has got this there. And, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, yeah. it's true, right? I mean, it's just not worth it for so yeah. many people. I mean, that's, you know, and you look at the kind of CTV, like Mike Duffy became a senator and Pam Wallen became a senator, like former broadcasters became mm -hmm. senators and this and that. And, and the, just everything now is completely different. Uh, people have often said to me, you know, why don't you run for politics? Well, first of all, I don't want to. I'm, the, I just spent 12 years flying from Trump down to Toronto. I'm just not going to, I don't want to go to Ottawa. And, you know, see, here's the thing, PEI. For sure. Uh, PEI, 170, 165, 170,000 people. And what we do as a make work project is we make our parliament have 26 members of parliament. So <laughs> this would be Kitchener having their own provincial parliament with 26 members. So we have 26 members of parliament. Hmm. You need roughly 1,800 votes to be elected, right? And uh, then we have city councils in both Shawtown and Summerside. One's 10, one's six. So we're just, we're so just everybody governed. everybody there's a politician. Totally. We're governed to death. It's <laughs> hilarious. We're governed to death. It is. It's unbelievable. Like, you know, people will run on a, a promise of a new hospital in, in Bob's Your Uncle PEI. Elected. Throw a hospital in there. Well, we can't get any doctors. <laughs> Don't worry about it. We'll do something. <laughs> we'll do it ourselves. We'll do it wow. ourselves. It's true. Yeah. So it's. Yeah, I'm pretty content doing what I'm doing. That's so. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're going to Italy soon. I mean, yeah, yeah, pretty happy with that. Be doing that. Yeah, too. so we had a boat, well, and you know, we really got. You know, the thing about being retired is this, and people kept asking me, how, 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 what do you do every day? I said, well, there's just some days I don't do nothing. But the key was for me when I retired, I always had maybe not doing something that week or that month, but I always had something to look forward to. You know, and I, you know, I knew I was going to Florida for part of the winter. And then I knew Heather and I were going here. So I always had something to look forward to. And then bang, like I went 580 days without seeing my kids and grandkids during the pandemic because they were here and I was in PEI and we bubbled that sucker off. And so, uh, you know, so then I had that terribly, I didn't, I didn't find it depressing or anything. And you could talk to them on Facebook, but it's not the same. Yeah. And now you've got your, your grandkids, you know, all of a sudden, instead of them being, you know, uh, two and four, they're four and seven. And, and you've missed that kind of two years thing. Yeah. So th the great thing now is that since, um, since the new year, I've been up, this is my fifth time up here, I think. I drive most of the time, but we flew this time. But we went to, my stepson's a pilot up in Red Lake, uh, you know, in Northern Ontario. We went up and saw him. And then we had the people... Uh, the people with the 12 passenger van were down and then, yeah. and then we had the Canada Am reunion. Then we came here, then we go into Italy and then I'm coming back up in September. Uh, a buddy of mine has a golf course that I'm going to MC golf tournament for him up in, uh, St. Joe's, Ontario. Sweet. So I have something to look forward and then I'm going to Portugal next uh, winter. So now though, I'm back in the mindset of having something to look forward to. To me, that's always the key. It's, you know, oh, aren't you doing something every day? Well, no, no. Well, what are you doing? Oh, I don't know. Fiddle, this, that house is clean, whatever. But I always know I got something around the corner. Right. And to me, that's that's what it's all about. Always yeah. having something. And, and truly, you lived a life of being a bit of a hobbyist, doing the thing that you loved, and now you're still doing and, what you love. It is what it is. And it's that's, the same life. That's exactly true. And and that's the great thing for me about living in PEI. Uh, you know, it's, it's smaller. Um, and <laughs> I mean... We, we had a, we had a, when the kids were younger, I was at the, I was out at the, out there we call it the Zares is a superstore. So, right. yeah, but it's owned by the same company. And uh, so a, a lady that Heather had looking after the kids when I was uh, kind of going back and forth and I had gone to the superstore one weekend and I was shopping and everything and, and uh, Heather, the, the sitter comes in one day and says, oh my God, Lorna saw Jeff in aisle seven. <laughs> she saw Jeff in aisle seven. So when you try to get away from it, right? Right. Yeah. So you start always being recognized. Price check, Jeffson aisle seven. Code red. <laughs> Code red. Jeffson seven. Jeffson seven. So I enjoy that aspect of being a little like your my entire career. Um, uh, I I talk to everybody. I must be on 15, 25, 30,000 fridges because I pose for every picture. And I like that. I mean, because again, it's only because they watch. That's why I did mm -hmm. it. So to be able to... Oh, to kind of step a little back from that and just kind of, you know, is great. I'm, I'm probably more of a, a, you know, 
uh, sometimes a loner and I don't mind it. Like I'm good being alone. My, my wife, Heather still works. So, you know, I'm, I'm, she goes to work and, and th that's what that is. When I took the, I remember I mentioned that Canada M cruise I took with, with scenic. So now I'm on a ship with 168 people. I'm by myself. Heather's not there on this cruise because she was working. There were 168 Canada M fans and we're on one of these river cruises, which are great. So we're going down the, uh, the Danube and, uh, um, uh, I'm <laughs> by day two, I'm having to pry open my sweet door to look in the hallway to see if there's anybody there to see if I can get down to get breakfast <laughs> before I, before I was, I, one day I, I took this. So, and they were just, all, but they were just, first of all, you had to be really conscious of the fact and aware that they had all paid you know, six, $7,000 per person to come on this, uh -huh. this cruise. So now you're very aware of that. And oh my God, I was exhausted. And I remember one day I took one of these electric bikes from Linz to Rudesheim, which is about a 35K bike. And I did it with 40 people because I tried to do something, sit with them, drink with them, which I mission accomplished, but I tried to do something with everybody. And so I'm, I, we do this thing, I get back to the ship and they, these guys were all going to this hundred year old, which would be young in Europe, uh, bar, like a, built in a castle. And I remember I was sitting in the lounge of the, the, uh, the, the ship and I could look out and I saw the 160 people on the deck. I put a lag of woolen in front of me. I'm just kind of leaning back like this. I've got the glass, like first sip. And then the lady from the desk comes in and goes, Jeff, the cruise director wants to talk to you. He's on the phone. I said, okay, okay. So I got up and I said, yeah, hey, Marcel, what's going on? He says, these people are not going to leave unless you come. So... <laughs> Oh my God! No, so then out I go. We marched. We all marched down to the to the to the uh, beer hall and had dinner. But so that's about the point of that is you always had to be on all the time. Yeah, and being on all the time, I was good at it, but I, I enjoyed it. But I don't like being on all the time now. But yeah, I've never. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I mean, in our business, like you, know, the the people who are watching or paying the bills. Those are the, the most important people. They are the most important people. So And there are super fans. Total super fans. Oh yeah. Oh we've oh yeah. <laughs> Just reminded me of a super fan story, but it's okay, here it is. Let's so <laughs> pry it out of me. <laughs> Come on, guys. So in nineteen ninety nine we got this uh, binder sent to us from a uh, a seniors home, long term care facility in Calgary. And so the binder had about 245 pages. I think that's how many Canada AM sh shows there were every year. And then uh, it had a few less than that because it didn't have a page for every day Valerie wasn't there, Valerie Pringle. And we, when you opened the book and started going through it, these people had taken pictures every day of what Valerie was wearing and commenting on it, and they did it for an entire year and sent us the book. Valerie wore pants. Valerie wore those same pants four days later. Oh, Val man. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. I know. I don't know how you can do Sorry, Valerie. Yes, yeah, I know. I know. So. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's interesting. People, what they do with their time, you know? Yeah. Well, clearly, you know, they had a lot of time. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> well, uh, Jeff, uh, before we uh, sort of close up shop, um, Oh, sign? Would you do the Would honor? Do oh, absolutely. Honor? Absolutely. Um, well, you know where, where Danny's balls were. Yeah, I'm going to go uh, to an adjacent area. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and feel free to draw a picture. Oh, <laughs> as you can see others. Well, and first any, of all, anywhere you want. I'm looking at someone here. I don't know who, who's this or did the duck. It's darn good. Somebody drew their was... whole family. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's Mariah. That was Mariah. Right. I'm, uh... I'm hoping that's a dog. Yeah, you see, I don't have my glasses on. Hang on, you, you I'm hoping that's a dog. You should have seen it when she too. first drew it because she started with the eyes of the dog. So she made the and it, we were wondering what the hell are what you drawing? <laughs> True. <laughs> True. I gotta get a picture of that. That's funny. Okay, and okay. Uh, yeah, feel free to stand up. Is that a hat? Is that a... That's a scuba diving mask, I think. Because you know what it looks like from here. <laughs> Whoa. It looks, oh. like, it looks like the same thing from here. I was just saying. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jeff. This is wicked. And as per usual, the scraping yeah. noise we hear is 
the big black sharpie. That's right. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple or somewhere, that's what that is. Gonna need another table here. The message is getting long. It's yeah, all good. true. <laughs> I'll, I'll just push it over. That's wicked. Thanks, Thanks guys. Jeff. Thank you so hey, much. Hey, listen. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. It's always fun. Thank you. Oh, this was this was awesome. This was yeah. just awesome. This, it, 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 this is great. Uh, we have this celebrity in the house. Oh. Yeah, man. Uh, and I knew him when. Huh? Yeah, way back. That's ah, that's <laughs> awesome. No, thank you, Jeff. That's true, though. It was way back. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, All guys. Right. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, cut it, D. <laughs>